Hyperconnection, a dangerous game to play. Written by Luis Robles. Narrated by Kevin Giese. Chapter 1. Tate. Pam. It was silly to call out her name. I was already aware that she wouldn't answer. While I loved my girlfriend through and through, she would be in the exact spot I found her each day I returned home, curled up on the couch and plugged in. Stepping into the kitchen, I set several bags down before moving over towards the living room. I was right, as usual, but I still found myself smiling. She looked cute, tucked away in her corner of the couch, wearing my large hoodie and giggling at something unseen by myself. Babe, I called out gently, reaching and squeezing her arm. The touch caused her to jump, but she smiled shortly after, laughing. Taint, I'll be off soon. I just need to finish up this level. Sure thing. I knew what one level meant. It would mean that ten from now she would finally take a break and tell me all about the new game she bought. In truth, I've completely forgotten the name already, but she would surely remind me later. I'm going to get started on dinner. She wouldn't hear me, not with those large headphones, but I still spoke regardless. This had become quite common for us, at least for me, speaking to the empty air, unaware if she was truly able to hear me or not. Turning on the television, I returned to the kitchen and started to unpack the groceries, grabbing what I needed for dinner. The news was droning on in the background, discussing local traffic and weather. Simple information, but I enjoyed this more than the hitting stories. Honestly, I had no interest in our recent leaps with technology. While so many people seem to enjoy completely separating themselves from reality, I found it silly, perhaps even childish. A phone was used to make calls, not all these insane applications that pulled youths away from each other. That being said, I was still dating someone who was more than a little enthusiastic about the advancements in tech. While at first I had found her off-putting, due to her opening line being, Have you heard about that new reality that takes you beneath the sea? She grew on me throughout the evening. She expressed fondness for all things, not just technology, and was even interested in learning more about my profession. Shocking, really. Most people weren't interested in learning more about a man who worked outside of virtual reality, who worked within the area as an architect. I enjoyed my job, down to the very core. Being able to lay down an idea using good old pen and paper was priceless to me. It was peaceful, even if a tad lonely. Most of my colleagues didn't share my passion for old-fashioned methods. Whereas they enjoyed using GATE and their applications to create buildings, I was contented with a pencil in my hand, even with the blisters and errors that came with this choice. It helped that many of our top clients actually praised my old-fashioned tactics, saying they liked seeing that not everyone forgot our origins. It was the little things such as this that made me smile, that made my habits worth it in the end. Moving on to our main story for the evening. Gate recently held a conference to discuss their latest expansions and to address some of the questions from within the community. Gate, as we know, is the driving force behind nearly all advancements within the virtual reality industry. Throughout the years since they first opened their doors, Gate had created programs that were once thought to be impossible, that were science fiction and only told in stories. It's been remarkable, everything that this company has been able to achieve. Remarkable was certainly a word for it. I didn't like Gate, and it was rather obvious to anyone around me as to why. I didn't care for their insistence that everything was going to be better under this false reality, that life was better when tucked away from the truth, hiding online and wasting away in real time. That was how I viewed it. Pam often told me that I was far too pessimistic and I truly was trying to work on it. I simply found it hard when I had to deal with these advancements being shoved down my throat at every turn. According to their CEO, Gate will be holding another conference soon, in which they will be releasing information about their next project. Everyone is very excited, to say the least. I, for one, can't wait to hear more about this mysterious project that we've been hearing so many rumors about over these last few years. No one is quite certain what the project will be about but we can confirm that they did state this new project will open up many opportunities in the coming months. Now, on to our next story. If it wasn't up to me, I wouldn't even have a television. 
most people these days simply logged into their VR for updates on local and national news. In truth, I had never even purchased a piece of advanced technology. Growing up, I kept my head down and worked with my parents on our land, a large piece outside the city where my father cared for farm animals. Despite everyone being plugged in constantly, they still had needs, and my family's farm earned quite a bit. I started with my father when I was young, hands always dirty from the soil and face burned from the sun. Pam teased me about this during our first date. So you were a country boy? That's super cute. Did you, like, ride horses and stuff? Her questions, quite similar to that one, made me laugh from the beginning. Not because I was laughing at her naive nature towards my lifestyle, but how curious she became. The way she leaned towards me to hear more. Her eyes lit up as I explained every answer. Yeah, we had a few horses. It wasn't a ranch, just a farm. We raised cattle and crops. The horses were mainly just to help us round up the cattle when they explored too far. One of the pros about this VR push was that the land outside the city had become unwanted. The connection to the tower that drew in so many was rather weak out on the farms, which caused many people to clutter up in the city. I found it rather annoying how crammed and cluttered the city had become over the years, always having to build new apartment blocks, and yet the streets remained rather desolate. Even schools were becoming scarce. So many institutes, both primary and continued education, removing their facilities online. Yes, students were able to actually stand at the bottom of the sea during biology class, but it just wasn't the same. When I was in school, we worked in groups and dissected creatures together, pored over books and shared notes. I explained this to Pam during our first date. She simply giggled and called me an old man. While I had been addressed like such in the past, it was much sweeter coming from Pam, she said it with a giggle, touching my hand and continuing to ask questions. She was truly interested in my thoughts, in my history. It was nice, having a real conversation on a date. These days it felt like I was speaking with robots rather than real women. Pam seemed to feel the same way as myself, stating that I was unlike several of the men that she had dated in the past. Apparently I was real and honest. I found her comments endearing, and I started to look forward to our little dates. Date? Setting the plates down on the table, I couldn't help but smile as I heard her voice. Thin arms wrapped around my waist, and I felt the weight of her body as she leaned against me. Sorry for making you wait. I wanted to play for a while with Lizzie. She got Den, too. I was teaching her how to play. I figured as much. Come on, let's eat before it gets too late. Taking my seat, I poured us both a glass of wine from the thin bottle I had set down, sighing as I drank. I wasn't often one to drink, but I enjoyed wine with dinner and only with Pam. Tell me about it. I've been caught up with work. I didn't get a chance to hear about your game. In truth, I had no interest in her games, but I enjoyed hearing her speak about them. I liked hearing the details and giving her a chance to try and include me in this part of her life. You sure? She asked. I nodded, and she beamed, taking a bite and starting to speak with excitement. It was a large, fantasy-based game where you could be anything, from a hulking beast to a fluttering pixie. It wasn't a shock that Pam picked the latter, causing me to gently laugh. That certainly sounds like you. I spared her a wink, smiling as her face burned. I enjoyed gently teasing her, seeing those vivid emotions from the woman that stole my heart. Too often it felt like people held back their emotions. It was disheartening. It was so much fun. You really should try it out sometime. You could use my avatar or even make your own. It's so immersive, babe. I could smell the rain and, oh, I just loved it. The sun felt so warm and the flowers made everything so vivid and smell beautiful. Gaming had made a huge leap over the last few years. More and more people were becoming involved with these online games, not only to fight creatures, but also just to live out a life of fantasy. I didn't judge them, not in the slightest. I simply didn't find any appeal in the game. I enjoyed my reality, where I worked with my actual hands and where I didn't have to separate myself to enjoy a moment. Like now. There was no virtual reality that would ever compare to this moment. Dinner with Pam, with her smile. No amount of technology would compare to the warmth and shine of her being. We made it all the way up to level 23. It's amazing. Then there's this ocean that's huge. Did you want to go? I looked up from my plate now, catching the curious tilt of her head. Did you want to go to the ocean? I have next weekend off. We could drive down to the beach and go for a swim. The weather has been great lately.
There was a hesitation, but she nodded a moment later. She didn't want to go, but she agreed because I enjoyed being outside. Holding back my sigh, I simply smiled. I was going to drag her regardless. Sorry, Pam. Going out once in a while was good for her. Kept her healthy. Too many people these days seem to have degrading health despite the rapid progression in medical science. Too many people had virtual appointments which didn't pan out as successfully as a physical meeting would. As we finished up dinner, I continued to listen to Pam, smiling as she continued on with the game. She spoke in great detail about a castle she explored, how amazing it felt to fly with her wings in the game. I listened to her while focusing on my food and continued to listen as I cleaned up. Pam lingered by the sink, helping with the dishes as I put away the leftover food. The news had a story about Gate. Her head shot up and I chuckled, rolling my eyes. She was so predictable. I loved it. They are going to be releasing their details regarding that new project soon. I was listening to the details earlier. I thought you'd want to know more about it. They're planning to speak more about that expansion, something about opening up more jobs. I think they're going to be opening up a new office. Some of the guys at work thought so too. Pam smiled at me from the sink, slowly shaking her head. She always watched me when she spoke, but I could never tell what was going through her mind. Thankfully, she spoke her thoughts aloud quite often, even if no one asked. You didn't have to watch the news for me, Tate. I could have looked it up on my phone. I like keeping you informed. Leaning over, I pecked her cheek and stepped out from the kitchen, looking back at her. I'm going to wash up for bed. You should too. You already stayed up too late last night. Playing that game, no less. With a hum, she nodded and finished up the dishes. I left her there, heading towards the bedroom. I was honestly exhausted from work and couldn't wait to get into bed. I also couldn't wait to have my hands on my beautiful lover. Chapter 2 Pam I didn't know why I thought he was joking when he said we were going to the beach, and yet here we were, sitting on the hot sand, staring out at the lapping waves. The view was beautiful. There was no doubt about that. Tate certainly helped the scenery, standing out in the clear water with only his swim trunks and that charming smile. Uninterested in technology and always an outdoor type, Tate certainly had something most of the men I went on dates with didn't. That amazing body. I loved watching him wander the house shirtless, wearing only his boxers and tracing my fingers down his back, down those toned arms. I loved it most when he would lift me up, carrying me to the bedroom with ease, all the while my lips locked his. I shouldn't be thinking this. We were at a beach, a public beach, and my face was burning hard. Normally I would message Lizzie or Natalie to discuss how things were going at work, as well as gush about my handsome boyfriend. However, I made a promise to not VR today. Well, this was an ongoing promise between us. When we went for a date outside of town, we would leave behind all our all my technology, and just enjoy one another. Enjoy the world around us and our time together. I wish I could enjoy how beautiful it was out here, how happy Tate looked, and how pleasant the weather was. There was something about being outside in the reality that was different from the VR. However, I couldn't place it. I always tried to make the connection. However, I never could. Was it the smell? Perhaps the heat? These were all the sensations I had felt inside those false realities, but I had given up my hunt long ago. So, lost in my thoughts, I didn't realize Tate had left the water and made his way towards me. Without warning, cold arms wrapped around my shoulders and caused me to cry out. Tate! I shouted his name loudly, slabbing his arm while he laughed loudly, burying his face against my neck now, gently kissing the nape of my neck and squeezing my body against his wet torso. I whined as his body started to soak the white tee that I was wearing over my bikini, squirming in protest. You're such a jerk, Tate. Stop, stop, you're cold. Finally letting go, Tate sat down on the towel beside me, leaning over and firmly kissing me. I loved when he kissed me like this, firmly and with a hand cupping my jaw. It felt amazing, the way he held me close and kissing me so possessively. His affections always made me weak at the knees, melting against his touch. Come in the water, babe. It feels great. Seriously, no way. It's way too cold. Besides, I like sitting up here and enjoying the view. You certainly know how to put on a good show. You're a brat. His arms finally pulled away from my torso, squeezing my shoulders and standing. Do you want to go for a walk? We can grab some sodas or something. Maybe even some ice cream? Tate knew I had a sweet tooth, 
and was using it against me. He was so adorably cruel. With a smile, I accepted his hand, standing and brushing some sand off my thighs. Fine, but you're buying. I expect nothing else. He laced our fingers, and I found myself grinning ear to ear, my fingers tightly squeezing his own, heart beating against my chest. Despite having dated for so long, Tate still gave me butterflies in moments like these, when he was so charming, when he was so sweet. As we walked, I started to talk about work and the game I was playing with Lizzie, which he listened to contently. Honestly, I couldn't tell you why he puts up with me. Then, when you reach the temple in the forest, there is this massive guardian that you have to challenge. The creature was huge and made of ice. Honestly, it was so cold. I'm so happy it's summer. Tate was a rather quiet guy with an odd sense of humor. However, from time to time, he enjoyed making little remarks that caused me to laugh and slap his arm, rolling my eyes. Don't be a brat, Tate. Seriously, though, you should really play this game. It's so fun. I bet you'd be amazing at it. I really doubt that. He smiled while saying this, squeezing my hand. I adored these moments with him. However, guilt started to weigh heavily in my chest. I needed to take a moment and speak with Tate, but I just couldn't find the time. I didn't want to ruin our afternoon together. Insisting that I was fine, Tate returned to the water. He always enjoyed being in the ocean and watching him beaming from the waves. It didn't take me long to follow him. After finishing my treat, I shed away my tea and didn't even make it to the waves before Tate scooped me up. Yelping in surprise, I kissed him eagerly, running my fingers through his damp hair and allowing him to carry me out towards the wave, which lapped at my legs and caused me to shudder. You said it was warm. This is beyond cold. This is like ice. You're a sadist. I lied. Come on, this is way better than that beach simulator you like. I can heat that water. Which was a fact. I did enjoy my beach VR, which was mostly due to the fact that I could adjust the water and make it warm. I invited Tate to join me many times. He did twice, but it simply wasn't his taste. He claimed that it felt too forced and the hot water felt like someone peed in the pool. Honestly, sometimes he was such a spoil sport. Still not this beautiful. Your little simulator doesn't quite catch the smell of salt. Does it even have jellyfish? He asked the question with a brow raised and I snorted, nodding. Of course. You can add any animals that you'd like. You saw a jellyfish? I had been in the process of setting my legs into the water when he made the statement. Gasping, I practically jumped back in his arms, tucking my face against his damp neck. Babe, you brought me into the electrified water? I could hear him laugh now, only growing louder as I smacked his chest in response. As the afternoon dragged on, Tate eventually left his second watery home, and we finally dressed. Returning to our car, we made the long trek home. The drive took roughly two hours, and we grabbed dinner along the way. I was rather quiet on the ride home, my head filled with thoughts. Tate simply smiled, handing me my VR contacts and nodded. He didn't mind. Grinning, I had slipped on the contacts and returned to my comfortable false reality. With the contacts settling in, the world around me vanished. I was no longer sitting in the car watching the trees fly by. I was sitting at a small desk made of glass, all my applications blinking at me from the glass. With two fingers, I shifted through the programs before selecting my personal favorite, a park. While I was aware I could simply ask Tate to take me to a park, there was something special about this, about being the only one in the area, about being alone and having time to think. Rapidly, the office around me dissolved away, and I found myself standing in a field. Lush grass brushed against my bare feet as I walked towards a large oak tree. I sat down between the roots and smiled to myself, it was warm, and the soft breeze carried the scent of flowers, the type I couldn't place, but I adored the scent. It was always a comfort to me. This park had been one of the first applications I ever purchased. Though it had been updated numerous times since its creation, this small spot has always been my personal little haven. I was scared to talk to him. I've never been frightened around Tate before. I didn't like it. I wasn't frightened that he would grow angry and harm me. Never thought. Tate was a quiet, docile man. He loved me as much as I loved him, which was why I was frightened. I didn't want to lose him when I admitted the truth, when I admitted that I had accepted a different position with work. While accepting a new job was not that big of a deal, it was the particular job that I had agreed to that would prove to be the issue. Being a virtual assistant, I had met many clients over the years, and I have become quite confident and organized. My employer always praised me, 
saying I was one of the best he ever had and that I was the only reason he even stayed on top of so many projects. While his words always flattered me, I never once assumed he said such things to others, until I was approached by a man my employer often worked with. They were beginning a new project, and he wished to have my assistance. There would be tight deadlines, multiple accounts that I would be handling, and the work would cause quite a cut in my social life. Nevertheless, the payment for such work would be well worth all the trouble. It was too good to be true. It was everything I could have hoped for. Except that it was with a company that Tate couldn't stand. The position was with Gate. I already accepted the position. Starting shortly, I would be the personal assistant to Mr. Rivera, one of the leads on the project and one of the head members of Gate. It was the opportunity of a lifetime. I couldn't just walk away from it. Babe? Closing out my application, I kept in the contacts but returned the view to my own. Tate was staring at me, head tilted with a faint smile. We were inside the house. He had plucked me up and carried me inside without complaint. He was honestly too good to me at times. This was becoming harder by the moment, and I found myself starting to lose my will. I was so pumped this morning to tell him about my new position, but now I was just terrified. Are you okay? It looks like there's something on your mind. Did you want to talk? Did I want to talk? No. Did I need to? Yes. This was not something that I could keep to myself. I needed to be honest with him. I had to tell him the truth because, despite not waiting on him before taking up the position, this was something that was going to affect both of our lives drastically. It would affect our income, our living situation, but I was terrified of how it would affect our relationship. Tate already felt that I spent too much time in the VR world. This was only going to make this worse. Uh, yeah. Actually, I did want to speak to you about something. Shifting to make room, Tate joined me on the couch, and I could already see the frown forming. After being together for so long, Tate became painfully good at reading my micro-expressions and preparing himself on how to approach them. It's about work. Remember how I mentioned there was a rumor about promotions? Well, it turned out it wasn't quite a promotion, but rather a new project that they are working on. They need to expand their team and are looking for the best workers from my team. You're avoiding the point. They asked me to work with the project lead as an assistant. There. It was out in the air now. Tate stared at me for a moment, surprised, but he started to smile. Reaching out and taking his hands, I gently squeezed them. I wasn't nearly as happy as him, simply shaking my head when he tried to speak. It's not with my company, babe. It's with a new company. It's with Gate, Tate. That faint smile fell within moments, and I couldn't bring myself to look at him. Still gripping his hands, I tried to speak again, but just shook my head. I know you don't like them, but this position means so much to me. It would mean so much to us, babe. I'm getting a huge pay raise, like, huge. When this project is over, I don't think I'll need to work again. I can retire. And you don't have to keep working anymore on those projects you don't like. You could start your own freelance projects. We could move anywhere we want. When I finished speaking, Tate wasn't looking at me. I stole a glance, and in that moment, I felt my heart shatter. He looked so broken, his shoulders slumped, and only my grip was keeping our hands together. Gate projects aren't like your current work, Pam. I've known people who worked with that company. They don't just give you a virtual office for a few hours. It takes up days of your life, sometimes weeks. Months. His head jolted up with a sharp, what, and I just sighed. It was so hard to look him in the eyes, to admit the details of this project. That new facility that they are opening up, they want me to be part of that project. They put you under for several months. They said it was four tops, but it could be five or so. I would get a month off during that time, at least, so I will have a chance to see you and be with my family. They said I'll be completely taken care of, all my needs, and they will make sure my health... No. His voice was stern, causing me to wince. We rarely fought like this with raised voices. In fact, we rarely fought at all. Tate was a calm man and well-versed with expressing himself. We were able to talk about our problems. This was more than a problem. I made a mistake, but there was no going back now. You have to tell them no. You can't do that. It's, it's a horrible idea. It can't be healthy to spend that much time immersed in the system. You can't take this job, Pam. Please, I need you here with me. His words were desperate, as were his eyes, and I could feel my heart begin to shatter. I already said yes. 
Pam. My name was whispered, wet eyes staring back at me for a few moments before his hands were yanked away. Tate quickly stood now, turning his back. My chest grew tight, and I tried to speak but couldn't find the words. While I stuttered, he started towards the bedroom. I could tell from his stance how dejected he truly was. I'm heading to bed. We can talk about this tomorrow. From his tone alone, I knew that we were already done talking. Waiting until he was behind a closed door, I finally allowed myself to cry, burying my face in my hands. I didn't want to lose Tate, but I couldn't turn away from this deal. It would set us for life, and it was a job I have always dreamed of. Since Gate opened its doors, I dreamed of working with the company. I couldn't choose between my dreams and Tate. That wasn't fair. That night, I slept on the couch with my wet cheeks, tightly clinging to a stuffed bear Tate bought me a few valentines back, desperate to hold anything related to him. I wasn't sure when I would ever hold him again. Chapter 3 Jordan It says here that you have 50 hours logged in just this week. Jordan, we've talked about working yourself too hard. When you work too hard, you become stressed, and that is when insomnia starts. I hated coming here. I hated the shrink. I hated these conversations, but most of all, I hated this office. An actual physical office within the city. Slumped in the large chair, I glared slightly. I didn't want to speak about work. I didn't even feel like I needed to be here. However, my manager demanded so. Apparently, my paranoia was beginning to affect my work. It wasn't paranoia. It was the damn truth, but no one wanted to listen. I'm sleeping fine. I snapped at the good doctor, turning my head away now and staring at the wall. Several pictures hung, displaying peaceful images, most likely locations he had never even traveled to. I had been there, in the VR. After staring at those images for so long, I thought perhaps I could find peace in these locations. My demons followed me, however, whispering in my ears. I was never fast enough to escape. Tell me about your dreams, then. You mentioned a dream about running, correct? Yeah. All my dreams involved running, always from something unseen. It's the same as before. I sighed, letting my head fall back against the chair as I spoke. I'm running from something behind me, but when I look back, there is only darkness. I can't see what's in the shadows, but I know it's there, staring back at me, watching and waiting. I run as fast as I can, which, mind you, is fast. I was in track as a kid, and I always think about this during the dream, that I'm trained, that I'm faster than anything chasing me. I'll be fine. Yet despite that, I always end up feeling the hands grab me, grabbing my arms and neck. They yank me back, and everything goes black. That's when I wake up. You have said in the past you woke up in a cold sweat, sometimes even crying. He really didn't have to mention that bit. However, I still nodded, even if I didn't wish to give him the satisfaction of being right, that I am working too hard and it was affecting my mental state. Jordan, last time we spoke, I suggested some alternative methods to help with your stress. Medication, sleeping aids, and I even offered to have you given a note for medical marijuana. You're the one refusing to try anything. Honestly, the worst enemy in this situation is you. I truly think that you should consider one of these options. A few nights of good sleep should help clear your head and get your mind straight. My mind is fine. You're the one that's not listening. I always listen. You could test me if that would help to prove my dedication to your situation. I have always listened and taken detailed notes. I enjoy listening to you. Do not for a second think that I have taken your words and situation lightly. Fine. If that's true, then you have to see where I'm coming from. The project isn't ready. I've told them over and over. Mr. Rivera won't listen to me. He keeps saying the deadline has been set and they are going forward. Chelsea, she... It's not ready to sustain life yet. Charles was staring at me, and I found myself still glaring. I refused to call this man a doctor, nor by his family name. He was Charles to me a simple man with a profession that I honestly didn't think he was very good at. Besides, he was recommended through Gate, and so I already found myself suspicious. Chelsea is fine, Jordan. 
I don't know who put this idea into your mind, but she is completely fine. After being immersed for so long, she missed her family, and Gate paid for her to go see her mother for a few months. Remember, she has a mother in, let's see, Ohio. You're the one who told me where she lived, so you should know they are very close. She just wanted a vacation because, like someone I know, she was stressed. She... she went to see her mother? Charles nodded and I stared silently. Taking a moment, a smile was forced and I dipped my head forward, resting my face in my hands. Oh. Oh my god. My voice came out surprised, exhausted, but in truth I was scowling against my hands. His words were complete and utter bullshit. I knew she didn't go to visit her mother because I left out a very important fact when I was speaking about her mother. She died two years ago. It was something that Chelsea had only shared with me and her husband. Her mother passed away from suicide and didn't wish for other people to know that information. I wasn't shocked, honestly. Her father had been lost to a tragic accident a few years before, and her mother wasn't handling it well. Who could? losing the person they loved in such a violent manner. Protecting her privacy, I never told Charles this bit of information. I spoke as if she was still around, and his lie hung heavily in the air. Forcing a smile, I lifted my head now, aware of the tears welling up in my eyes. I didn't... She didn't say anything to me. We're best friends. Are you truly sure? From what you and your co-workers have told me, it seems to me that you are very forgetful lately, forgetting your keys, your code to work. In fact, last week you told me that you forgot you even called me earlier that day to set up a meeting when I returned the call. You've been forgetting days and conversations. Perhaps she did tell which you completely forgot. Another lie. I had called him that day, however, I lied and said that I had forgotten. I was too terrified to leave work after I found out that one of our interns had been placed in the system after Chelsea vanished. She was only 18. I refused to leave the operating room, and I stayed in the system with her, monitoring her vitals and holding her hand through the process. She was bright-eyed, hopeful, and kept gushing over all the details. It was hard to keep smiling through her joy, to pretend that this was an honest push of technology instead of this dark, horrid program. They had to leave the system when they realized I was not going to leave until she did as well. I lied to Charles, not wanting to admit my fears over the phone. He didn't believe me, but they were recording my calls. I knew they were. They had to be. Someone had logged onto the system using my code, a code that only Chelsea knew, that I had given her over the phone. They murdered her. I knew it for a fact. They logged in with my code, went into the system, and killed her. I had proof. It wasn't with a knife or a gun. It was far worse than that. They disconnected her mind from her body, in a manner of speaking. When placed into the system, there was always an emergency escape button I had implemented through during early testing, and I had never removed this coding. Only I had the access. Someone had logged in with my numbers, removing the coding, erasing the only chance of exiting the program without a manual override. When I realized this, I panicked and ran to the chamber that they had locked Chelsea in, only to find it completely empty, clean and open and ready for the next beta subject. She was gone. Her desk was cleared, all her items gone. I logged on and tried to trace her IP, checking her stats and recent activities. Nothing. Since we were last in the system together, since we last spoke, she was gone, as if she vanished in midair. Until last week. It's just so strange, you know. I saw activity on her IP, which is strange. If she's back home, why would she be using her work IP? Charles stared at me, his emotions unfazed, and a simple smile was provided. Perhaps she is disobeying her managers and doing some work from home. Sound familiar? I forced a laugh, nodding. I recall you doing the same when you were placed in the hospital for work-related stress, Jordan, both you and Chelsea are extremely hard-working and driven people. He paused for a moment, reaching to pat my hand. It took everything not to yank away in disgust. The last thing I wanted was this lying snake to touch me. He was part of it. He was part of this entire thing. Gate was lying, and no one was saying anything. 
The system wasn't quite ready yet. I proved this time and time again. The system we had created wasn't quite yet ready for long-term submersion. Our first few trials were awful. First, it would start with a migraine that would cause slight textural glitches within the UI. Then this would turn to straining on the eyes, which would cause desaturation of the world around them. These were all the issues that we had tackled the moment they became present. However, when one problem was crushed, three more popped up. Besides, there was still the issue with missing subjects, the deaths. Besides, let's just say Gate was correct and that I was crazy, that my theories were idiotic and this man wasn't a lying rat. That would mean Gate was far worse than I imagined. This was evident from our tests alone. All that left me with a horrible guilt. The stress had caused our first original beta tester to need medical attention. He screamed for hours, saying the buzzing wouldn't stop, that he couldn't hear and he couldn't think. Though taken to the ER to be attended and given a clean bill of health, work stress, they said, he was found hanging in his apartment the day he was sent home. A messy note simply said he wanted the buzzing to stop. The second beta tester, with a fear of claustrophobia, was not originally told she would be placed within a chamber. The simulation started to fall apart, and she ejected with my system. I was not aware of the chamber. With me, she was left in a chair. And the stress caused cardiac arrest. I was mortified and wasn't able to enter the engine room without having a panic attack. I was not the only member of the engine team suffering from this horrific backlash. We all dreamed of the original betas screaming and the seconds begging cries. None of us had the access code to open the chamber. I was trying to bash open the lock when security came in, throwing us from the room. She was dead before they even kicked open the door. Three more beta testers passed away, each for different symptoms. Though it took longer before each other felt the effects and passed, no amount of adjustments or work was able to fix this error. The human brain simply could not handle being submerged for such prolonged periods of time. I pleaded my case with Chelsea at my side that they needed to stop this project. We were ignored, and she grew irritated with being shoved to the side. Chelsea stated that she was going to figure out how to stop this program, even if it meant pulling the plug herself. I told her it was a fool's errand, but she simply laughed at me. Unbeknownst to me, Chelsea had coded in a kill switch that lay deep within the program and told me with great confidence that she hid it terribly well, that no one would be able to find it without her aid, and that she would put an end to this horrific project. Regretfully, I helped her set up in the chamber and she simply winked, saying that I owed her Chinese when she saved our butts. I laughed and agreed. She vanished. We said she was offering herself as a beta tester. She was only there three days. The other subjects were within the system for months before the symptoms. The system didn't kill her. Gate killed her. They had to. It was the only solution that made sense, and apparently I was the only one who knew. I had to keep up my facade and save face until I could expose this horrific project for what it truly was. You're right, Charles. I'm sorry. A tear traced down my cheek and I quickly wiped it away, struggling to stare at this man with a smile. If I thought about her for too long, I would break down to tears, a shell of the person I once was. Thanks for talking with me, sir. I think I do need a break. I think I'm going to sit down with my managers and discuss a vacation. Charles smiled at me gently, nodding. Good, very good. We think so, too. We? I asked softly, curious as to what he meant, before my answer came brutally. A hand grasped my shoulder tightly and I yelped, trying to stand, but the hand kept me in place. Charles smiled gently at me from across the way, the hand grasping my jaw and shoving my chin up. I was choked from the gesture, trying to reach up and claw at the hands that grasped me, but it was too late. Pain shot through my body, cold metal pressing against my neck. I screamed as the blade pressed against my skin and slid inside, warm blood spilling down my collar and staining my shirt. The action wasn't done quickly, but slow, dragging the knife across, parting my skin and allowing blood to spill out. I tried to speak, gagging as blood sputtered from my lips, mouthing help. Adjusting his glasses, Charles smiled, crossing his legs. Rest well, Jordan. Chapter 4 Tate The office was so quiet, I could hear the clock ticking from the wall. I needed silence to keep me calm, to help keep me focused on my work. 
any sounds were a distraction, and the last thing I needed was a distraction. A large project had been dumped on my team, and for once, I was thankful to be working to the bone. It gave me a reason to stay at the office for hours, to stay away from my home. I started sleeping at the office more than once, just passing out at my desk. Not everyone in the office felt the same way as me. Some people enjoyed their music. However, over the years, they have learned to wear headphones and provided me with my silence. I had been working with the same team for nearly five years now. It was easy to learn what we liked and disliked after rubbing elbows so often. It's been three days. I still haven't left the office. I wasn't in any sort of VR either. Some of the younger boys liked that style, but it honestly wasn't my taste. The process felt fake. Just plugging a few numbers and letting it form, I needed this older style. Using my pens and stencils, it helped to keep my mind focused the best I could. Anything to keep my thoughts from wandering. From thinking about her. The grip on my pencil grew tighter, but thankfully not harming my line. A box of Chinese food lay to the side, waiting for me to take a bite, and yet I couldn't bring myself to even try. A coffee rests on the other side of my notebook, continuously filled and leaving me wired beyond a healthy point. My eyes were heavy, as was my head. It was growing harder to focus, but I kept pushing. I loved working, I truly did, but my heart was distant as of late. My usual comforts gave me little in return. Before, I often found peace in this office, the wide spaces with the lingering scent of ink and wood, and working with my hands, being able to carve and sculpt out models and design new sculptures. Lately, for obvious reasons, nothing brought me comfort. Every day passed slowly, seeming to drag on longer and longer than the last. I was starting to, very rapidly, lose both my composure and my mind. Setting the pencil down, I stared at my design for a few moments and then allowed my head to rest against the desk. A soft sigh escaped through my nose, shoulders slumping as I allowed my body to look as defeated as I felt. I just wanted to sleep, if only for a bit. Tate! So much for sleeping. It had been a nice thought. Ignoring the fact that I knew that voice all too well, I kept my eyes closed, attempting to ignore him. You can't ignore Emmett. I've spent years trying. Nothing worked. Nothing would ever work. Emmett, though a sweet and kind boy, had a voice you could hear through a wall. It wasn't annoying per se, just loud and excited. He was always excited, like a puppy brought to a new family. Tate, don't fall asleep, buddy. Do you need some coffee? I could grab you some. Or maybe I could grab you breakfast. He was still speaking loudly, but I had to smile. Despite how his voice did keep me from sleeping, and how tiring I found our interactions, Emmett was still a sweet kid with a good heart. All he wanted was to talk and bond, something I could easily get behind. Being the youngest, and thus newest despite being here for a few years, member on a very old team was tough. I knew from the start he was going to have trouble, and didn't mind when he stuck to me like a shadow, copying my methods and later adapting them to fit his own. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Pushing my chair back, I stood and grabbed my wallet, allowing Emmett to lead the way. His grin stretched to both ears, a bounce with each step as he led me out towards the hallway. Though we were only a few years apart, I had little to nothing in common with Emmett. He was like Pam, madly in love with VR Gate and with Elysium, that horrible virtual world, spending hours on those MMO games. I had seen his scores, and while they didn't compare to Pam, they were close. Close enough she huffed over it in the past and logged in more hours to stay on top. I had teased her during that time for being a sore loser. Now I wish I had begged her to spend more time with me. Are you okay? This was a question I found myself answering more and more of late. It was becoming rather difficult to keep brushing off the concern, insisting that I truly was fine and all the worry was silly. The worry was justified. I had been losing weight, and the bags under my eyes were starting to match the charcoal that I worked with from time to time. I know you've been having a rough time with mon- Don't. I spoke as gently as I possibly could, shaking my head. I didn't really want to talk about Pam right now. I couldn't get her out of my mind, however I didn't want her to take up my conversations as well. 
Emmett, I understand the concern, but I'm fine. Well, I'm not fine, but I will be. In time. I just need to clear my head, get something to eat, and have a good sleep. Honestly, the stress of this project is the main reason for my issues. That was a lie. Emmett knew. I could tell from the way he stared at me, the way his brow arched slightly, slowly blinking at me. It was such a bullshit excuse, but it was the only one that came to mind in a short time. I feel you, man. Oh, thank goodness. I knew he was only saying this to comfort me, but I didn't mind in the slightest. I would gladly keep playing around with this farce if it meant avoiding speaking things with him. This project has gotten most of the team. Everyone seems really stressed out with everything that's been going on, between the rush deadline, the news always talking about those missing people, and, you know, general life, yeah. You're quite the Aristotle, speaking like that. He smiled, despite my rude comment. Even when I was cruel to Emmett, he knew it was only in good humor. As young and slightly irritating as he could be, Emmett had a good heart. The team had grown quite attached to our resident puppy. He honestly was just like an overeager puppy. We can all have a nice, long rest when the project is over. That's something to look forward to, and that little hope is all we really have. Jeez, man, you're talking like it's the end of days. He squeezed my shoulder now, grinning at me wide and innocent. That was my favorite aspect when it came to Emmett, that natural innocence that he seemed to never lose even as my world darkened. Honestly, it's not nearly as bad as you make it out to be. Sure, she's away on a job, but she's going to come back. You never know, maybe you can patch things up. I doubt that. I wasn't very kind. I'm aware that our fight, that our breakup, was more or less completely my fault. I could have said that I would wait. I could have encouraged her, supported her, but I didn't. Instead, I grew angry. I yelled. Yelling isn't the right term. I was very short with her. I never actually raised my voice with Pam, or with anyone really. It couldn't have been that bad. It was. I told her that if she preferred her addiction over a man willing to give up everything for her, then she could enjoy her data streams. Perhaps she could program someone more understanding. That's what she would want. Someone as playful and as addicted as herself. She cried, and though I wanted to take it all back, she left the room. I didn't have the courage to chase after her. I was never good when it came to fighting. I always folded too early, willing to accept that I was wrong and move on. I doubt I can take back what I said. Admittedly, I wasn't very kind with my words. It wouldn't surprise me if she wouldn't want to speak to me, even after she came back home. I don't know if I want to talk about her. I'm still upset that she chose some job over our relationship. It's more than that and you know it. Surprisingly mature words for such a young man. Sighing softly, I slowly nodded my head. There was more to it than that. She didn't take the job just because she liked the pay. She adored the pay because it meant we would be set for life. We wouldn't have to worry anymore. No more pinching pennies and stressful months. I wouldn't have to keep working on these annoying projects, and I could actually start building things for myself. I wanted this. I truly did, but not if it meant her working with Gate. I simply didn't trust those monsters. It was just something about that company that always rubbed me the wrong way. You already said you don't want to talk about her, so we won't talk about her. We can talk about something else. Did you hear they added another sector to the Elysium? Now it's up to 123. And, uh, I got a new game. It's pretty cool if you want to check it out. It's called Novocaine, some mystery game where you try to solve a cold case murder. You could just read a book. This is way more fun and interactive. I really want to be Sherlock, okay? We can play it later. You can be my Holmes. Finally, I smiled, slowly shaking my head as I stared at Emmett in disbelief. Was this his way of cheering me up? It was terribly strange, but I was still smiling. I found myself enjoying this small moment. It helped to pull my head away from the dark, lingering clouds. Please, just give it a shot. Emmett, kid, I adore you, but <laughs> not a chance in hell. I didn't even like those books when I was little. I often was able to figure out the twist before the end of the book. This was harder when it came to the Sherlock books, but I usually had an easy enough time with other tales. Pam always loved challenging me, insisting that I had to be wrong, and was always thrilled when it turned out I had been correct the entire time. She liked when I showed off my intelligence, something I was rarely comfortable with. You're such a mood killer. 
Returning to my desk, Emmett pulled up a chair and smiled at me, squeezing my shoulder. I'll drop it for now, but Pinky swear that you're going to play with me eventually. I know you don't like this stuff, but there are some applications you'd really like. There are tons, like working out and even some that are just walking through a park. It's a great way to clear up your head. I'd rather just take a walk in the park. I smiled as he flicked my arm, picking up my pencil once more. Speaking with someone was actually quite nice. It was becoming more obvious how much I had walled myself off from those around me. This wasn't healthy. Pull up a chair and work with me for a bit. You can handle old school for a bit, right? I can try. He groaned while saying this, standing to go grab some supplies from the shelves across from my desk. When he returned, I laughed lightly, flicking his arm back. How about this? Go old school with me on this project, and if you do it with me, I'll try out this VR stuff. You can help me make an avatar and play one of those stupid games. After a moment, his face lit up. Are you serious? He grinned now, nodding quickly. Okay, okay, deal. We can do this old school, and then I get to finally pull you into the future. You're going to love it, trust me. I doubted that, severely. But I suppose the promise was worth seeing that joyful look on his face. I adore this dweeb of a kid. Yeah, yeah, let's just focus for now. Chapter 5. Pam I had virtual offices before. In fact, I have always worked in virtual offices since I graduated school. Many of these were generic, and I always had several other people around me. It felt like I was truly working in an office despite being at home. This, however, was completely different. Not only was I in a real office rather than a square, I was also given creative freedom. I could shape and design the office in any form that I felt fit my style. Needless to say, I went a bit crazy when it came to my creative freedom. At first I had made all the walls a pastel pink and programmed a virtual cat. It was cute and silly for the first few days. But in time I settled and readjusted to my real style. Pastel blue walls with one wall being entirely made of windows. I was able to change the view as I wished. However, I had grown addicted to the window having a view of a beautiful beach. A very particular beach, actually. It was a local beach near my mother's house, which was where Tate had taken me for our first date. I could remember every detail, and I couldn't stop myself from grinning as I mapped out the details as I recreated one of the best things that happened in my life. I missed Tate. I truly did, but I had to focus on my work. My office was large, giving me room to pace and think. I didn't feel tired, which was strange, but it provided me with time to work. With them taking care of my needs outside this reality, I didn't crave food and was free from distractions. I suppose that was the point, to provide people with a way to work constantly and not have to worry about people slacking due to needs like oversleeping, being too hungry, and so on. I did still nap from time to time, if only to take a small break to clear my head. I never woke to feel rested. In fact, I never truly fell asleep. I simply lay there with my eyes closed, thinking of what I could be dreaming. It helped to pass the time and calm me before moving on to my next assignment. I thought that I would be working hand-in-hand -hand with the manager, but it didn't seem the case. He often appeared in my office, though it seemed like a hologram. I could see just slightly through his form to the walls behind him. Mr. Rivera was a very nice man, charming and collected. However, I couldn't help admitting that I felt rather lonely here. We only spoke on occasion and very briefly. I was under the assumption that I would be working on his side within the VR, but instead I was giving my own personal office that was attached to a large area of cubicles. I was able to step out and work with the interns from time to time while having my own spot. It was nice. I enjoyed having my own space and being able to work at my pace. Another day, another dollar. It did often lead to me speaking to myself and the cat. I kept the cat that I originally programmed, a small ragdoll cat. She often curled in my lap and paced around and on my desk. I adored when she slept in my lap. Being able to feel the warmth from her little body made me smile, and I loved nothing more than burying my face in her soft fur. Everything was so vivid here, more vivid than any VR I had ever dealt with. So, Isabella. Large blue eyes stared at me. The cat was currently curled in my lap tail flicking and listening as I spoke. I think I did pretty damn well today. I went through all the figures, readjusted some of the budgets, and even planned out a small vacation for Mr. Rivera. 
He's going to head to Spain with his wife. I tapped the pad of my finger against her small pink nose and she mewed in response. I could probably program her to speak, but that was a bit out of my expertise. As I was designing this office, leaning back in my chair, I stared at the ceiling, petting the creature and reflecting. Tate could have designed this way better than I did. I once saw him design a triangle office for someone. Who wanted a triangle office? I giggled weakly, peeking down. Bella's head was tucked beneath her paw, sleeping and ignoring me. That's fine. It was honestly expected. She was just a digitized pet, and I didn't expect her to hold out a fleshed conversation. I've been thinking about where I want to go for my vacation. I always wanted to check out Alaska. I heard you can see whales from boats. I've done a VR tour of Alaska once, but I want to do the real thing. Tate promised he'd go with me, though he's terrified of boats. The last time we stepped on a boat, he clung to the railing for dear life, often snapping at me to stop leaning over the edge and stressing him out. I loved when he worried about me. In truth, I actually kept leaning just to hear him fuss. Setting aside Bella, I stood from my desk and approached the large windows. It only took a few taps against the pane for the windows to slowly open, allowing a hot breeze to waft through the office. The smell of salt clung to the air. Stepping back, I pulled up my profile and began reading through my specs. Since taking on this project, my logged hours have nearly doubled, but so has my score. Though I was working most hours of the day, it wasn't frowned on to take a break now and then. When I wasn't taking a false nap, I was bouncing around through my games. It was fun, being able to log into my games for longer hours and to push myself harder than before. The oddest part, honestly, was eating during some of the MMOs for health. After several weeks with the program, I had nearly forgotten what it was like to eat— the first time I had an apple, I almost didn't know how to respond to the sickly sweet taste in my mouth. It was lovely and strange. For a moment, just a moment, I questioned if apples had always tasted this way, unable to actually recall if they had or had not. Come to think of it, I didn't really have much of a sense of time either. During those days, it felt like time passed much faster here than the real world, which was nice giving me the ability to accomplish anything inside Den while still returning home to have dinner with Tate. Bella, do you think I'm becoming a workaholic? Having a conversation with ourselves, Miss Pam? The sudden voice made me jump, and a slight yelp escaped. Quickly turning, I saw the faintly translucent form of Mr. Rivera. He was handsome for his age, sporting salt and pepper hair with a gray suit piece. He smiled at me gently, arms folded behind his back as he stared at me. I enjoyed speaking with him, however I didn't enjoy the way he eyed me. It often made me feel as if I was the translucent one. Good afternoon, my dear. I came to see how you were faring. Are you concerned about your mental health? He spoke like a robot, but his voice was soft. It felt as if every word was whispered, and I simply laughed, shaking my head. No, sir. I was just having a go with Bella here. I was simply rambling. I'm perfectly fine. More importantly, did you receive the documents that I sent to your office? Mr. Rivera slowly nodded, walking towards my desk and eyeing the small cat perched on the edge. She mewed and he simply raised a brow. Ah, that's Bella. I see. I'm glad you were able to figure out the UI without much difficulty. If there are any codes you seem to be struggling with, please simply reach out to our support and an AI will assist you promptly. No one knows the system better than those born from it, after all. For a moment, I swore I saw a smile, but it faded too quickly to tell. I did receive the files, which is why I came here. Thank you for figuring out some vacation time. That was very kind of you. My wife will be very happy with the news. You are doing exceptional. Despite his words seeming robotic, if not scripted, I simply grinned. I enjoyed being praised like this being told that I was an improvement to the team, that my efforts were making a difference. Thank you so much, sir. I really do enjoy this project, and I look forward to giving you all the assistance that I can. My voice was more chipper than I was feeling, but I knew the mood would fade with time. We are going to have a board meeting soon. I would like you to attend. I will send over a file with all the details, and if you have any issues, again, feel free to contact our AIs. The team is very excited to meet the young woman that is helping both our advancements and our cause. Thank you, sir. I'm happy to help in any way that I possibly can. I really was. I had adored this company for so long, 
and I truly did believe in their cause, to continue creating advancements within the virtual reality the world had become so obsessed. Recently, they mentioned possibly trying to figure out a way to hook up comatose patients to the system and to give them a reality within the system so that loved ones could communicate. It is currently only an idea, and they are not even sure if it's possible, but this is why they invited me to the project, to assist them as they try every possible angle. Very well. I shall leave you and Miss Bella to enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Reaching out, long fingers scratched under the feline's chin, her tail flicking in response. Please feel free to take a break for a few hours and relax. You are doing a tremendous job. Just as quickly as he appeared, he vanished. Mr. Rivera was a mysterious sort. I honestly didn't know what to make of a man like that, but he didn't seem all that bad. A bit strange, but that didn't make him inherently a bad person. Beaming, I made my way back over to the desk, closing out of my programs for the evening. Hear that, Bella? I was given permission to slack off. Guess who's going to play Den? She mewed and I snickered slightly. Don't judge me. Gotta be sure I stay at the top, and that requires work. Stepping away from my desk, I logged into my UI and swiped through my applications before selecting Den. Within moments, my office dissolved away, revealing a bright world beneath. My clothes went with the office, my pencil skirt replaced by my rogue outfit. It was a bit tight for my taste, but cute either way. It only took a moment before I was finally connected, my UI fading and the sounds of the game surrounded me. I could hear NPCs talking around me, laughter off to the side, and even the sound of birds above. Suddenly I'm surrounded with people, both AIs and those online. This was what I did to get my social fix when I needed it. This was what I did when I found myself lonely and unable to focus. It wasn't the same, but at least it was something. Something to keep my mind off Tate. Chapter 7. Tate. I never thought I would see the end of this awful project. But here we were, finally free from hours of sketching and weeks of planning, the entire team was relieved when we reached this point, throwing a late party, which was a very loose term for the word, because in reality we simply gathered up a ton of beer and took out. It was a nice break for the entire group, and it was the first time I actually spent time with anyone since Pam left. It was a nice change of pace. Finally having a day to myself when I didn't have to bury myself in work, I decided to drop in to one of my favorite locations in town. It was a small cafe that carried an old-school theme, which simply meant that everything was done by hand and they did not encourage people to use their VR equipment inside the building. Well, it was mostly because it was beneath a large office and the connection wasn't the best. I had been a regular at this cafe since it first opened, always dragging Pam here to enjoy some tea while I chugged down caffeine and caught up on deadlines. Pam was never a fan of coffee, but I enjoyed watching her go into detail about the different uses of tea leaves. I never enjoyed the taste, but I loved seeing how she lit up when speaking. Just a small drip in the paper, if you can. Sorry, Tate. I can get you the drip, but the Daily stopped printing, shifted all their reports to the Elysium feed. She laughed gently at my scowl, tapping my hand. Holly had been working here since the cafe first opened, and we were close friends by this point. She understood my dislike for the advancements and agreed with me for the most part. She too was a kindred soul, seeking to stick with the old fashion rather than plug in and waste away her days. We do have some rental glasses, nothing big, some of the original frames they released. Doesn't do much, but you can change the scenery and read the feed at least. Well, it was honestly better than nothing. Giving an apologetic smile, she offered me a pair of thick sunglasses, with a defeated sigh, I accepted them with a thank you, tucking the temples of the glasses over my collar. They dangled as I accepted my coffee cup, tapping some sugar into the dark liquid and glancing up at Holly. She was eyeing me, curious, and I finally sighed. I could always tell when she was trying to hide something from me. Just ask, Holly. Are you doing okay? I know everything with Pam, and I just... Are you doing okay? Yeah, I'm doing fine, Holly. You don't need to worry about me so much. I've just been working hard on a project. The bags will go away eventually, with time. Just need a few nights of hard sleep and maybe some days off. Okay. She smiled warmly now, 
glancing behind me to ensure there were no customers being held up by our conversation. Well, if you'd like some company, you have my number. We can get some beer, and I could kick your ass at some video games. I still have those old-school racing, one for the television. You're such a hoarder. She laughed in response, and I couldn't help but smile. It had been so long since I felt like smiling. After Pam left, I felt like my life was in pieces. I still felt this way, but I was getting better with each passing day. Smiling was easier. Conversing with others became less painful. I could handle this. I could handle being away from her, at least during the day. At night, she would take over my dreams, tormenting me ruthlessly. Thanking her for the coffee, I tucked myself away to a table in the corner, pulling out my notebook and sketching away. The glasses were set aside for the time being, which I would tend to shortly. In truth, I wasn't one who often followed current events. I only started doing so to keep an eye on Gate, to keep up with their advancements and hopefully hear any news of Pam. Which was pointless, actually. She was only an assistant, and had not once made the news. Still, that didn't stop me from hoping. That didn't stop me from watching all those news networks, just as I used to provide her with information about a company I had no interest towards. I didn't want to think about Gate right now. I wanted to focus on myself. I wanted to focus on my designs. Pam wasn't wrong when she said I wasn't a fan of my current company and the projects that we worked on. We were often given as little details as possible, provided with supplies and deadlines, yet we rarely saw the fruit of our labor. Call me a perfectionist, but I wanted to see my designs in real time, which did not account for Elysium. That being said, we did design for locations inside of Elysium just as often as we designed physical locations. Even then, we rarely saw the buildings that we helped to create. I truly did want to pull away from this company, to begin working on my own and hopefully become a freelance designer. It wouldn't be too hard in this day and age. Freelance had become rather popular with how heavily people relied on virtual reality, and the younger crowd wasn't very keen on being tied down. Looking back, Pam's heart was in the right place. She wanted to help me. She wanted to make me happy. I just couldn't accept the route that she took. She didn't have to join that awful company. She didn't have to partner up with men that I was pretty sure were the scum of the earth. Don't ask me why. I can't give exact reasons. Just something about the head of gate that rubbed me the wrong way a feeling I could never shake. The cafe slowly began to fill with other patrons, but I gave them little attention, far too focused on my notebook and what I was drawing, the layout for a flat, one that was a decent size that made creative use of the space within. I had been working on this particular design for quite some time, in hopes that it would one day be used by both Pam and myself. Despite parting ways, I found myself returning to this page time and time again continuing to add more and more details with each passing day. The design was coming to life. However, I felt no pride over the matter, which was the most disheartening of it all. Setting the pencil aside, I reached for the glasses before hesitating, glancing up at the singular television in the cafe. The news had been silently playing, the volume set remarkably low, but there was a flash that got my attention. Large font reading, Breaking News, zoomed in and faded, the previous video stopping and instead the image was now focused on a woman sitting behind a desk with a thin frown and worried eyes. I glanced at Holly as she started to turn up the volume, leaning over the counter to hear better. We've just received news of a large-scale explosion downtown. A group of civilians were shooting for a school project and caught prime footage of the explosion. It appears that the main office of Gate has suffered a large attack. Whether this was an attack from an outside source or perhaps issues from within, we're not sure. We are aware, however, that Gate has been doing research into a large number of medical programs and coma victims. They have received numerous threats in the past from religious zealots who were against their ongoing advancements, threatening their safety if they continued to play God. I was frozen to my seat. I knew that building. I had never stepped foot inside, but I knew the outside by heart. I passed that building every time I went towards my office, always staring rather absently at the large walls. That was where Pam was working. The entire wall had been blown out. In the shown video, shaky as it was, large flames and smoke expelled from the massive hole. People were screaming, sirens were blaring, and my heart stopped. We have received word from the emergency response on site that the fire is large but manageable and there is no danger of spreading. 
So far, two bodies have been confirmed with an unconfirmed list of injured. Our ER units are working fast to evacuate all personnel from the vicinity of the fire. However, as we know, many gate employees are submerged during their hours of work. So far, we have been informed that the hubs are in good condition on the other side of the building from the explosion. This appears to be from the boiler side of the building, attacking the building pipework rather than employees. The confirmed bodies were two maintenance workers. That is all we currently have, but don't worry, we will continue to keep constant communication and will update everyone accordingly. Please stay logged in to your Elysium feed and the names of those injured will be released shortly. Do not attempt to contact friends or family that may be victims. It will distract the works. Thank you. Back to you, Nathan. I couldn't breathe. My eyes were locked on the screen, staring down the shaky image of the flames. All I could hear were the people screaming, even after the audio cut. For a moment, time froze. No one in the cafe moved. All eyes were locked on the television, and my heart pounded against my ears. Only maintenance workers were hurt, however. Pam was in that building. It was believed to be an attack from the outside. Someone was targeting Gate, and Pam was locked away in an electronic cell. Without thinking, I jumped from my chair. My legs slammed against the table, cups spilling across the surface and floor, chair clattering to the ground. There was a collective gasp as I broke the trance of the room, hastily walking away from my table and yanking open the cafe door. Behind me, I heard Holly shout my name, but I didn't look back. The moment I was past the threshold of the cafe, I started to run down the sidewalk and through the crowd, indiscriminately shoving people aside, running as fast as I could towards my office. I needed to get back to my office. Feet pounding against the ground, I weaved my way through the alleyways behind buildings, avoiding the cluster of police and fire trucks near the gate offices. My own was only two blocks away. I made good time, knowing the way well from jogging through here during the mornings. I didn't stop for a second. I didn't care who I shoved aside or what cars I cut off as I darted across the street. The door to my office was thrown open, and I swiftly made my way up the stairs before throwing open the door to my workroom. It slammed against the wall loudly, everyone's head shooting up. They all had been staring at the television as well. I didn't care about them. I only cared about one particular person who was sitting in the middle. Emmett. Chapter 9. Emmett. I never actually expected Tate to take me seriously on my offer to join me inside Elysium. I always thought that he would make some excuse, tell me that he'll think about it, and then avoid the subject completely. I didn't mind, honestly. Sure, I really did want him to join me and to share this amazing world with him, but Tate had his own interests. I wasn't about to shove this down his throat. That would be horribly rude of me. Besides, Tate was always respectful when I wanted to talk about the game. For hours. I really could talk for hours. My love for Den was rather concerning when it came to my friends and family. They always feared I'd stay logged in and prefer the game to real life, a situation that was becoming more and more common in society. This, however, I could have never expected this. Finding Tate before me with such a desperate look in his eyes, trembling as his hands grasped my arms and tugging me closer, demanding that I aid him, demanding that I take him into Elysium. I had never seen Tate crying before, and... While his tears were only clinging to his lashes during that moment, it was enough to shatter my heart. How was I supposed to say no when my friend stared at me with an expression such as that? We were at work when he came to me. However, I didn't want the others to see him like this. Refusing to linger with those prying eyes, I made quick work of leaving with the disheveled Tate and bringing him back to my apartment. Due to our contract being over, no one was going to stop me from leaving early. In fact, no one really cared. The office had become quite a drinking fest since we finished the project. Making the way back to my apartment, I spent most of the evening calming Tate, providing him with a bottle of water, rubbing his shoulder, and just hearing him out. The explosion at Gate hit him hard. I didn't need to ask why. Pam was there. Pam was submerged there. Everyone on the team knew how much she meant to Tate. She was his entire drive, the reason he worked to the bone, and the spark behind his passion. It was beautiful the relationship they had. I always found myself jealous, only due to the fact I had never known such a relationship. However, I was still young and there was still time. Well, my status was not the topic of conversation. Instead, what was important was that, in time, I was finally able to calm Tate. His anxiety started to simmer and he finished the bottle, finally calming, giving us a chance to talk and for Tate to gather himself. Any better? 
I eyed Tate for a moment, smiling when he provided me a weak nod. He worried me deeply. Since the breakup, Tate had become so withdrawn and detached from everyone. I was always concerned that he would quit and I would no longer see my friend. Worse, come to learn that our friendship was merely just friendly co-workers. That was not something I was looking forward to having. I adored the older man and truly did want to teach him about Elysium, to help close the bridge between him and his love. Good. Just take it easy, okay? The only reported deaths were maintenance workers, which means that she's fine. That gives us time to talk and think the situation over, because I heard what you told me, but I have to admit, it's pretty insane. I mean, Tate, I trust you, but breaking into gate through Elysium is, well, pretty insane. You've never even used Elysium. How the hell do you expect to break in, and to what end? What was he expecting to find? I need to find Pam. I need to get her out of that horrible system, no matter the cost. Please, Emmett, you have to help me. Teach me everything you can about Elysium and help me locate Pam. She's in that system somewhere, and I have no other way of speaking with her. It's hard to explain, but there's something going on. I have this gut feeling. You have to trust me. I did trust him, which is why I just sighed rather than laughed and slowly nodded. If this was what he truly wanted, who was I to say no? Tate has never asked me for a single thing in the past, no matter how many times I offered up my assistance. If I was to turn him away the first time he asked, what would that say of me as a friend and a person? Well, if we're going to do this, we're going to have to get you into the system first. You'll need to make an account and an avatar. After that, we'll get you used to the system, then see about this whole breaking in ordeal. Sound good? Fine. His voice was distant, and I could feel my heart drop. I hated seeing this side of him, this broken man that seemed so distraught. I missed my calm but collected co-worker that I always found myself looking towards for assistance to guide me during times when I felt lost. It was strange having our roles switched. Stepping away from Tate, I rummaged through my closet for a time before making my way back to Tate with a nervous smile, setting a box at his feet. A large box filled with numerous items. All VR items. Tate stared at me for a moment, a brow raised, and I couldn't help my nervous smile, rubbing my neck rather nervously. I was going to wait for the holidays, but I guess this can't wait much longer. You got me VR gear? He stared at me in obvious disbelief, soon looking back down at the box and rummaging through. Shifting aside several pieces of equipment, I saw a very slight smile dawn, slowly shaking his head. This is new. It was, some of the latest that had come out. I bought them around two months ago, but I didn't think that Tate would actually know new from old. Yeah. I eyed him a moment, but he explained shortly that Pam had been speaking to him about this equipment. She saved up for several weeks before they were finally able to afford the new gear. As he explained, I could feel him staring at me, eyes narrowed, clearly questioning how in the world I came across the funds. I didn't mind the stare. It was understandable. I did not speak about myself often, nor my income and family history. Unbeknownst to many of those that I worked with, my family had quite a bit of money to their name, all of which was left to their children in a shared bank account. I lived in a studio apartment with only the equipment being my poison of choice, and my continued work with Tate and the company aided me in putting in as much as I withdrew. I wasn't an only child, mind you. However, my sister worked just like myself and continued to put back what she withdrew. This kept us with a steady backfill when we needed extra funds, while also teaching us responsibility as we grew. My parents, they passed, left behind quite a sum for me. Tate continued to stare and I frowned, shifting nervously under his leveled gaze. So, you chose to spend it on me? On a gift for my friend, yes. There was a reaction, finally, the slight curve of his lips, and I found myself smiling in return though far wider and brighter than his own. I was happy to see that little smile, as slight as it may be, on his face. Besides, even if I didn't already have this gear, I would have gone out and bought you some. This is important to you. I want to help in any way I can. We're going to get Pam back, I promise. That slight smile grew a fraction more, and Tate slowly nodded, running a hand through his disheveled hair. He looked a right mess, but things were not hopeless. After all, Tate had me to teach him and I knew Elysium better than anyone, at least anyone who didn't help design the system in the first place. Back during its early years, I was a very young and excited beta tester. 
I had been following, observing, and testing Elysium back when the program was first launched in its terribly buggy state. In every new cell or addition, I was always quick to offer my assistance with testing and with poking and prodding for errors, glitches, and tweaks. My sister always told me I would be far better suited as a designer than an architect, but I preferred my current position. I enjoyed creating buildings, seeing my creations come to life in the real world, applied and sustained without pixels and engines. I trust you, Emmett. Let's just get this thing set up and over with. I could tell from his tone that Tate was far more nervous than he was allowing himself to show, but I still smiled, trying to keep the situation calm and Tate's head leveled. As long as I kept him calm and focused, we would be able to go forward with this adventure, to pursue this rescue mission Tate had formulated in his head. I was here to support him, even if the situation made me terribly anxious. Taking a few moments, I allowed Tate to rummage through the box for a bit longer before explaining to him how we set up the gear, assisting him with getting everything connected. It didn't truly take long before the setup came online, and I was grinning at Tate, making sure the goggles fit him perfectly before helping him sit in a comfortable position on the couch. The setup for the avatar and profile tended to take a bit of time, and I wanted to ensure that he would be comfortable during those moments. All right, so just log in with the goggles and create an account. We'll deal with the rest of the information. However, right now, let's just focus on your profile and avatar. There is a tutorial in there to help you navigate the system. If you need any further help, just ask and I can hop on, okay? He nodded slowly, then fell silent. I watched him for a few moments before gathering up my own gear and logging in. While giving him time to figure out the system, I ran through my feed, scanning over all the news postings from only a few hours prior. Every news station was blowing up with news about, well, gate blowing up. The only station that was not addressing the situation with speculation or concern was Elysium's feed, which ran very calm articles addressing the situation. According to their correspondence, the large explosion was simply due to some pressure that had built up in the pipes within the building, and nothing more. Yes, there were some injuries due to the explosion, however, they refused to comment on the two confirmed deaths. Instead of commenting that they will state on the record two of their dearest employees who were lost, however, they refused to release names out of respect for the families. I understood where they were coming from, however, I was still nervous. I found myself scowling as I ran through the feed, eyes narrowed. Other news outlets continued to state that this was clearly an attack on Gate, while others argued that there would be no reason to attack such a company. Their leading research was not pertaining towards weapons, medicines, or any research that would make them a target. Their advancements in technology were available worldwide for a competitive price. Where did that leave the company? Well, either the victim of a random attack or truly the victim of a random pipe incident. It wasn't unheard of, after all. It was a large building and these things could happen. It was just strange that such an advanced and wealthy company didn't take precautions towards this type of situation. Taking a breath, I logged out of the feed and finally signed into Elysium, completely leaving my feed to instead enter the system. It didn't take long, my connection was strong, and I was submerged in the system in only a matter of seconds. I was often greeted with a faint brush against my skin, as if stepping into a room of cold air each time. It was a familiar feeling and greeting, waking me up after a long day of work or during a lazy afternoon when I knew I needed something to get me up and going. That being said, when I stepped into the system, I wasn't greeted by the familiar feelings. Something was off. Something was different. A shiver traveled down my spine and through my entire body. I could feel a tingle down to the very tips of my fingers, and my hair stood on ends. Something wasn't right. This didn't feel right. It wasn't the chilled, subversive feeling like usual. My skin felt hot, and as I let out a raspy breath, I felt a strain in my chest. This was a new feeling, this anxiety and the struggle to breathe. I felt this outside the system when I was nervous. However, I never once felt this inside Elysium. I came to this world to escape this world, this anxiety I felt during my usual plane of existence. Standing in safe town silently, I took a few moments to gather myself, slowly blinking and adjusting. I never had to adjust to the transition before. This was utterly awful. Bringing my hands up, I stared at them for a while before running them over my face, allowing myself to take an uneasy breath. This was too real, uncomfortably real. There was something wrong with the system. However, I couldn't quite place it. I had been logged in last night and I didn't feel anything like this. Did it have something to do with the explosion? Had it caused something to go wrong with the system? If that was true, they should have closed down Elysium, 
they shouldn't have allowed people to log in. I took a nervous breath and waited before stepping away from my spawn location and looking around the area. I would know when Tate logged in. I was searching for users sharing my connection, but there was quite a space of time before I finally saw a name coming up, a name that made me choke a moment before I started to laugh. For a moment, just that moment, I forgot how frightened I had been about this strange sensation. My laughter was loud, loud enough that Tate seemed to have no time finding me because I heard a familiar voice off to the side. Emmett? A tone I rarely heard, so unsure and almost nervous. Trying my best to retain my smile, I glanced over at Tate and snorted even louder. I shouldn't have let him create his own avatar. What stood before me was a monstrosity. If it wasn't for the fact that his screen name was sharing my connection, I wouldn't have known this was my friend, not with his current appearance of dark, almost bruised-like purple skin, with blue eyes that were awkwardly far apart from a nose that was barely noticeable. His ears were as sharp as his chin, and his body was awkwardly tall and thin. His limbs were more like branches than body parts, and his hair was a horrible off-yellow. I tried to speak, but I just couldn't. Instead, I had my hand over my mouth, trying my best to muffle my laughter and contain the shaking of my shoulders. Tate, oh my god, you look awful. He glared at me sharply, and I grinned now, shaking my head. I'm so sorry, man, but you really do look bad. What the hell happened with your character? And besides that, what the hell is your name? Because while his face was bad, Leet Tater Tot 69 was just as awful. Where did he even come up with that? Did he even know what those numbers meant? I'm not good at things like this. You know that. I just hit random for both the name and the creator. I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this bullshit. Just leave it be. I honestly, truly can't. You're hard to look at, Tate. He glared at me and I offered an apologetic smile before stepping towards him. Look, I can fix this for you. We'll just log out and I'll hop onto your account and fix you up. Nothing big. I just need to be able to be seen with you. Emmett, shut up. Tate was irritated. However, he agreed with me. At least after two girls that were passing yelped at the sight of him, stared, then ran off very quickly. After that, he turned and sighed, agreeing to give me permission to clean up his horrible avatar. It was like a purple nightmare. Taking this as an opportunity to show him how to use the UI in more detail, I explained how to adjust the settings and how to properly log out. Once free from the system, I logged right back in with his credentials, taking on the horrific blight that he created. These were the times I was glad to be an architect. I had grown talented at reconstruction and demolition. With a bit of cash, some sleight of hand, and a general knowledge of how the customization worked, I was finally able to reshape his avatar into a proper reflection of Tate. Still tall but thick, and with properly shaded hair, short like his own and a profile that mirrored the man I had been working with for several years. Of course, at this point, I did take some creative privilege and kept in slightly pointed ears and added in some facial markings to give him more of a rough look. It was befitting of Tate, and I knew that Pam would like the aesthetic. While in his system, I arranged a few other things as well, such as adjusting his name to something less horrible. Tatia sold his time at first, but I changed it to a simple anagram of his name after, it was simple, and it suited his personality far more than my pathetic attempt at humor. Rearranging his UI for easier handling, I removed myself from the system and smiled at Tate as I pulled off the goggles, offering them over. But he wasn't watching me. He was staring at the television, still playing reports from the explosion. Tate? I spoke softly, and he held up a finger, waiting before turning off the television and staring at me. We won't be able to reach her from here, will we? If she's tucked away in some secret project, we won't reach her. They were talking about it on the news. Friends of people that worked there can't message them, even if they're online, and they can't visit them. Certain blocks have been closed off, restricted connections. You are talking like you have a plan. What are you going to do? We have to get inside there, Emmett. If we use these goggles inside of Gate, we'll be in their connection. That's how this stuff works, right? He stared at me desperate for an answer, but I found myself struggling to reply. Was he serious right now? I mean, yeah, but how the hell do you expect to do that? Just say, hey there, my girlfriend works here and I'm going to stroll right in. Never mind the fact that someone just blew up a part of your building. Promise I'll behave. He wasn't amused with my response. However, I wasn't amused with his inability to express his plans. 
Tate was never the best with communication, but I would pile drive that skill into his head if I had to. We were not going forward with this plan without carefully going through all the details. What he suggested just now was terribly dangerous. That's something that someone just suggested. That was a huge deal. That was dangerous, illegal, and just downright stupid. I'm with you all the way. Yet I said something stupid like that. Tate nodded slowly, giving a weak smile. I'm more than sure that we can find a way to sneak inside, but once we're inside, we'll have to try and access the system. Can we do that with just those goggles? Possibly? If not, we can just access it through one of the ports they have inside. I'm more focused on getting inside right now. Have you ever thought that over? Yes. It won't be that hard. We're just going to lie. I'm convincing enough. You just have to stay quiet and follow my lead. I'm going to get inside there. No matter what it takes. I didn't like when he spoke like that. It made me nervous. I frowned softly, staring at him a few moments, brow raised. This was a concerning situation, but I knew how serious this was to Tate. I knew that this was something we had to take care of. I trust you, Tate. Whatever you're going to do, I'll be with you. Promise. I meant those words, which was why I made little to no arguments as we gathered up our items, carefully storing them away in my backpack, and made our way out from my apartment. We were actually doing this shit. My head was already swirling even before we left. Chapter 10 Emmett I didn't live far from Gate, and so the blocks were noticeably clogged. People were clustered outside, speaking with one another, news teams were speaking with people and videotaping the location the closer we came. Taking the lead, Tate weaved us through the crowds and around the back. Stepping through an alleyway, we silently came up behind the building and were greeted by a rather strange scene. There were no news teams back here, this side of the building rather far from the explosion. That wasn't the strange thing, though. It was the fact that no one was back here. Not a single citizen. Not a single stranger. The back of the building was completely deserted. I could feel Tate stared at me, but I didn't look back. Instead, I broke away from his grip and walked straight up to the building. Tate hissed my name. However, I brushed off his concern and stood before a thin exit door, one of the only doors I can see on this side of the building. Looking to and fro, I glanced back at Tate, shrugging. Tate? Emmett, careful. I heard his warning. I truly did. But that didn't stop me from grabbing the doorknob of that door and yanking it open. It swung open without resistance, and I smiled without a thought. I could hear Tate walking up behind me, hand resting on my back before he passed me and entered the dark building. I followed shortly behind him, anxious but also curious. There was no one inside here. Literally, the room we entered was empty and dark. The lights were off, but they didn't need to be on for me to realize we were alone. The echo of our steps and the dead silence was enough. Shifting nervously, I brushed my hand against Tate's arm, gripping his forearm and gently tugging him closer to whisper. What the fuck is going on? Why is nobody in here? Doesn't this all seem too easy? It was easy, painfully so. I found myself growing more and more nervous as the time passed. There should at least be someone in here, a guard, anything. Yet the room was blank, empty, and my heart was beating hard against my chest. I'm kind of creeped out. Don't worry, just... He felt quiet, and I could hear Tate sigh beside me, though I had trouble seeing him. Just stick by me. Grab my shirt and we'll find some light. Lights could mean people, which could mean being arrested, or worse. Then we'll just have to be careful. I really wish I could smack him, but now wasn't the time. Now was the time for focusing, for keeping our heads straight and getting through this without being arrested, shot, or worse, banned from Elysium. Yes, that was worse than death to me. This system and basically everything involved had become an entire life to me. Dying would mean an end to everything, but being banned from Elysium meant one life dying while the other struggled to continue existing. That wasn't something I was prepared to handle. Not yet. We continued to make our way through the dark room until we finally found a door, a stream of light spilling out from the other side. Tate cracked the door, only slightly, and my body tensed. Stepping as close as I could, I peered over his shoulder and into the hallway. It was empty just as silent as inside the room. Sparing me a glance, Tate opened the door wider and frowned. There was no one, down either half of the hall. Moving swiftly, we hurried down the hallway, and I tugged his arm roughly, whispering. Do you even know what you're doing? I thought we were just going to get in the building to use the connection. 
Isn't this close enough? In the other room? No, I need to find Pam. She's in one of these hubs, right? We just need to find the right one and we can leave. That wasn't the plan. Besides, you can't just force eject someone like that. They have to log out. We're still going to need access to Elysium and to help her log out. He huffed in response, and I huffed, asking once more if he even knew where the hell he was going. To my surprise, he nodded slowly, a strange look in his eyes. Tate, what's wrong? Nothing. I mean, I think I've been here. That's impossible. That's not. Just leave it. I think I know where to go. That wasn't cryptic, not in the slightest. I was growing more and more unsettled with the situation, but I wasn't going to turn back. Not now. Not when we were so close and Tate seemed so desperate. I had to be here for him. I had to make sure that this idiot didn't get himself in trouble with his clouded judgment and rushed antics. Still, his words were heavy, and they were wearing on me. I wanted to know what in the world he meant by that statement, having been here before. No one had ever been inside Gate that didn't work here, not even beta testers such as myself that have been loyal since the day they first opened their doors. I can't even begin to explain to you how dangerous this is, Tate. Trust me, you don't need to tell me. I'm well aware how dangerous this is, but you need to trust me. I know what I'm doing. I have been here before. I know where they keep the hubs. I know where we can find Pam. At least, I think I do. Comforting. Sighing, I fell silent, following Tate's lead. There was no point in arguing with him at this point. As we made our way through gate, it was still empty and quiet. We had not yet felt the need to hide or face any true danger since entering this massive building. That wasn't good. From everything I read, from everything I heard, from my friends and my own family that worked with Gate, this place was loaded with guards, yet not a single one to be seen here. This was more like a ghost town than anything. I didn't like it. It was terrible, causing my stomach to twist. Tate stayed focused, driven, walking as if he truly did know where we were going passing several doors without so much as a glance, and only stopping before a very particular door. Tate? This one. He reached for the doorknob, but I grabbed his wrist, glaring. Nudging him aside, I opened the door myself, very slowly. Only a sliver so I could lean my ear against the frame and listen. I wanted to see if I could hear a conversation or really anything. Nothing. Just pure and untainted silence. Frowning, I spared Tate a long and silent glance before pulling the door open wide and allowing us both to step inside. Much like the room we had been in before, it was dark in here. All the lights were out and I scowled. I can't see a thing. This sucks. I know there's some application people have to see in the dark, but I don't have time. Before I finished speaking, a dim streak of light appeared and I tensed, whipping around to face Tate. The faintest smirk rested on his lips, a flashlight in his grasp. Cutting edge fresh off the gas station shelves. Shut up. At least the interaction caused me to smile, if only in the slightest. It helped to calm me slightly, to make me realize that even if this situation was terrifying, we had each other to rely on. I wasn't in this alone, and neither was Tate. We could support each other through this terrible plan. I guess old school isn't too bad. He nudged my side with his elbow and continued further into the room, casting his light slowly over the area. The steam from his flashlight was casting over a long row of hubs, all in a perfectly uniformed line. The only sound, aside from our footsteps, was the gentle hissing from the large machines and their many tubes. The ventilation system. It looked far more terrifying than I imagined. In the rendering images, the machines had looked so cool and interesting. Now they looked creepy and like chambers more than anything else. Swallowing thickly, I eyed Tate, but simply followed his lead only stopping when he came to a halt, causing me to slam against his back. Tate was much taller and thicker than myself, and I let out a surprised yelp. Ow! I glared at his back, gently punching his back. It's not that I had to be gentle. Even if I hit him hard, I doubt Tate would react. He was solid muscle, whereas I was... lither, and I truly hated when the guys at work compared us. I was much a designer and a thinker than a guy who got down and dirty with hard labor. So sue me. Tate? I spoke softly, but the moment I looked down, I realized why we stopped. Pam. She was still and frozen in her chamber, with Tate standing over her with a desperate look that didn't suit such a driven man. She's okay, I promise. She's just asleep. The look on his face was heartbreaking, as if he was staring at a casket rather than a chamber. I'll get the gear. 
Speaking softly, I took to one knee and opened up my bag, bringing out my equipment. I already started to draw out my goggles when Tate looked at me now, frowning. He shook his head and motioned me to follow, and I did so without hesitation. Shoving my equipment back inside my bag, I hopped to my feet and hurried after my co-worker, scowling. Tate, what's on your mind? Pam always told me that these hubs were the most advanced tech Gate ever made. The connection speed is faster, and that only workers of Gate have access, right? I nodded and he sighed, continuing to speak. So, if we're inside these hubs, we can have a stable connection. Besides, if someone did come looking for us, I doubt they'd look at the machines. You're insane! I thought you trusted me. He smiled lightly and walked over to two closed hubs, tugging at the locks hard. They opened with ease, a weak hiss being heard as the lid opened, and I frowned, shifting nervously. I trust you, but I'm just nervous. I've never used these, even when I was beta testing. I heard that they have tech issues, like sometimes they get stuck and stuff. What are we going to do if we get stuck? Instead of answering me, Tate lay inside the hub and closed the lid. I panicked, trying to shout at him. Was he insane? The door could get stuck and I would be in here alone. Did he even know how to log on? Before I panicked too much, the door opened and Tate stared at me, brow raised, his hand resting on an inner handle. Jerk, you could have just said something. Smiling slightly, I punched his hair rather roughly before sighing. Fine, fine. I'll show you how to log on. Just make sure you put in your details and I'll meet you inside the safe town. Tate watched me a moment, nodding before tugging the lid closed. Following suit, I tucked my bag beneath the large hub and climbed inside. It was strange, to say the least. It was like laying down to get an MRI, although you were encased in thick glass. The hissing from the tubes was no longer present. Inside was utter silence. Swallowing dryly, I carefully grabbed the headgear that rested inside the hub and hooked myself up. It didn't take long. Within seconds, the machine came alive. A gentle beeping was heard in the back of my head before my login screen appeared. Just a few taps, and everything was in order. I awaited my familiar tingle, but instead was greeted with the feeling from earlier that day. The swift, cool sensation across my entire body, as if I jumped out from a pool completely dry. The connection was strong. Impeccably strong. I was within the system in moments, and the change was so sudden. My head was swirling as I came standing in safe town and struggling to breathe. It shouldn't have been so difficult, yet this feeling was completely different from what I knew. This was too real. Sure, I always thought that Elysium was realistic, but this was completely different. This actually felt real. Too real. My head was aching and my hands slowly reached up to my head, cupping my face. We needed to find Pam and get out of here soon. Ever since the explosion, I felt almost sick lately when inside Elysium. This wasn't a fun false reality any longer. This was far too real. And terrifying. Chapter 12 Pam. There was nothing more troubling than the feeling that something was wrong, but being unable to figure out what was wrong, and thus unable to tackle the said problem. I always thought of myself as someone who tackled on problems headfirst. I was adaptive, clever, and, if I could say so about myself, quick on my feet. That was what caused me to last so long in this ever-changing business, ingenuity and knowing the right words to say at the right times none of which was useful at this time due to the fact that I had no damned idea what was going on. How could I adjust and confront an issue that I didn't know the form or details of? Something was wrong. I knew this for a fact. Mr. Rivera had been acting up strangely, quiet and distant. He always seemed as if he was distant, as if there was something heavily on his mind, and yet he refused to speak about it. It was troubling since I had thought that I was completely trusted. Yet it was more and more apparent that this was not the truth. Only recently I learned how many files I was actually blocked from. It was honestly unsettling. I shouldn't be locked out from any files. To make matters worse, yesterday I started to notice some glitching in the system. The settings that I was able to access before were now gone. Not even faded, simply gone. My UI was flickering quite violently for an hour or so. I wasn't completely sure what happened and I attempted to contact Mr. Rivera. However, I was met with silence. I sent out several messages, but I received nothing. This continued throughout the day, and I found myself growing more and more nervous as time passed. Bella, I called out, smiling faintly as the virtual fluff popped up on my chest. Running my fingers against her fur, it was soft and felt as real as the kittens I had as a child. 
I sighed and tucked my face against her coat. Nuzzling gently as I continued to pet her, I eased when the little cat started to purr. While I had to constantly tell myself this little creature was my own creation, I still found myself growing terribly attached. This was most likely due to the fact that I had no one to speak to for weeks besides this cat and Mr. Rivera. Well, he wasn't really the best option for a riveting conversation, which was honestly rather disappointing. When I watched his interviews, Mr. Rivera seemed like such a different man. He seemed more interested in debating and science. In all the interviews I had seen, he was eager to speak about the advancement of the company and always willing to challenge the minds of those that felt their devotion to technology was tearing apart humanity and causing them to forego life for this false reality. Since I started working with him, I had yet to see this side of the man, and I had come to accept that this was just a television personality. While it did make sense, I was still terribly disappointed to learn the truth. I had been looking forward to having scientific debates with him, to hearing his lectures on medical advancements and such. Stepping away from my desk, I made my way towards the window. I trailed through the screen settings for a few moments. It had been resting on a peaceful wood setting. However, I wanted to see the beach. I missed Tate. I would talk to him when work was starting to stress me out. Cycling through, the images available were the two default settings, a nice sunny background with a lush area of grass and fence, and a frosted glass. Frowning, I cycled through again, only able to choose from these two and my own wood setting. That was odd. I had created over 20 different windows that I could choose from. This was the fourth incident I've had with something I set up personally not working. I had sent in tech requests for the prior three, but received nothing in return. Honestly, it was growing rather irritating. Bringing up my details to check my messages, there was still zero. It had been blank for days, the past week to be exact. I had received one message from one of the other girls that was working alongside me on a project. However, my UI glitched and I lost the message before I was able to read. I attempted to message her back. However, I heard nothing. It was rather unsettling, to say the least. However, far more unsettling things were starting to transpire. The fact that I couldn't reach Mr. Rivera was deeply concerning. I should have access to him and his information at all times. However, it was almost as if he was logged off. In fact, everyone on my list was logged off as I scrolled through. That had never happened to me before. There was always someone on. There had to be. Like me, many of those people involved with the project were to be submerged for several months. There was no way they could log off without leaving the system, and it wasn't time for vacation yet. They would have notified me. You don't think there was an emergency, right? They would have contacted me. There is an alert system built in. I wasn't even facing Bella when I spoke, taking a slow breath. Just breathe. Just focus. The worry was all in my head. Running a hand through my hair, I groaned loudly and stormed over to my desk, tapping away at the flat screen that doubled as both a surface and my computer. I attempted to contact not only Rivera, but every single member of the team. This time, I didn't settle for a message. I selected them all to send a single audio log. Hello, this is Pam Woods. I've sent out a group message in hopes of hearing back. I have been unable to contact both tech support as well as Mr. Rivera. I was not sure if there is something going on or if the tech issue is on my end, but I need someone to come and get me. I've been having issues with accessing logs for work and therefore can't progress further with the project. Assistance is requested as soon as possible so I can help us move forward. Thank you. After my message was sent, I fell back against my chair with a huff. I was clearly irritated, and honestly, I hated being so awful, so needy. But I was starting to become frightened. This situation was completely new, and it didn't seem at all normal. Rubbing my hands over my face and kneading the heel of my hands against my eyes, I let out another long and loud sigh. Bella. I called out, patting my lap but felt no weight. She had, no doubt, left the room when I started recording. She always tucked away on my bed when I was recording. The box that appeared when I recorded frightened her. Yes, I designed that. I thought it was a cute and realistic feature. Letting my hands slowly draw away, I stared up at the ceiling silently, arms crossing over my chest and letting my legs cross. My hair dangled over the back of the chair and out of my face, allowing me to stare at the details of the ceiling without being bothered. I had designed every little feature of this place. However, I never once thought about designing the ceiling. 
it was still the off-white that it had been when I was given this box. Smiling lightly, I traced my fingers along the framework and tried to distract myself from the fact that I felt as if I was going insane. A short time passed. It didn't take long before I became lost in my thoughts from staring at the tiles. Due to being more or less cut off these last few days, I have had more or less nothing to do but work with the information I already had and sleeping or grinding away at some of the games within Elysium. It was fun for a short time, but quickly became rather boring. I quickly became stir-crazy without work to distract me from the fact that I wasn't enjoying this current project. In fact, I honestly hated it. I was constantly kept in the dark, and it felt like I was an afterthought more consistently than I was comfortable with. It wasn't just unprofessional, it was just rude. A small beep brought me from my thoughts, and I sat up quickly. A message. I had not heard the alert sound from my messages in ages. With a wide smile, I brought up the log only to be greeted with a message that caused my heart to sink. It was an automated system, notifying me that I needed to provide more information about my technical issues and that the email would be reviewed by one of their team members shortly. It did, however, provide me with some troubleshooting information. There were the usual notes asking if I had submitted a report prior that was unresolved, if I had attempted contacting my managers, and also if I had gone over a hard exit of the system. That particular note caught my interest. I had not attempted this. For some reason, exiting the system had never occurred to me before. Don't ask me why. It was such an easy solution. Then I could simply speak to the engineers in person and see what they had to say. Perhaps... I could use my technical issues as an excuse to go outside for a while. I never thought I would miss the sunlight so much, yet all I currently cared about was the warmth of the daylight. It felt so much different than the artificial one I had created outside my window. Pushing my messages aside, I rifled through my settings for a few moments, carefully reading through the details on how to safely perform an emergency exit and the paperwork that would need to be submitted once emerging from the game. Gate, if anything, was very detailed when it came to their procedures and paperwork. I didn't mind paperwork in the slightest, more so if it meant I could finally have a break from work. Even if it was only for a few hours while they fixed the information, I truly needed this. Closing out the notes, I pulled up the emergency log out in the system, entering my information, and hit enter. The screen rested, flickering as I hit enter, but nothing more. Frowning, I looked around before trying again and hitting enter once more. There was still no response, so I went through the logout instructions again, eyeing the pictures shown. In the images, there was a long and gray See You Soon button that was available below the information boxes. Returning to the prior screen, I entered my information once more and scowled. There was no gray box for me. In fact, there was nothing available on the screen. Taking a moment, it dawned on me. It wasn't just glitching out. Hitting enter should have worked. The logout button was disabled, which wasn't normal. Without hesitation, I quickly brought up my messages and replied to the automated one, titling it as an emergency. In very short words, I stated that my logout had been disabled and I needed to be contacted ASAP. This time, I received a message in a timely manner. It wasn't from tech support. It was a new message from someone that was apparently on my project list. However, I didn't recognize the name. Apparently, in my haste, I sent my logout issue to not only the tech support, but my entire list. This was why I didn't like rushing. I would make foolish mistakes and would make an ass of myself. Sighing slightly, I pulled up the message to apologize. However, I stalled as I read the very brief reply. It was to the point, short and simple, yet a chill ran down my spine. They removed the logout. They won't let you leave. Left-hand corner of the desk. Don't waste what little time you still have. What the hell? My eyes narrowed as I read the message, leaning in close for a moment, then checking the profile of the member who sent me that message. A female user, however, there was nothing else. Several hours logged in some of Gates' older applications, being both games and a meditation cube that was created a year back. The most time was spent here, the first within the office app that was, well, where I was working right now. This was so stupid, yet my curiosity was eating away at me. What could she have possibly meant by the corner? I glanced over towards the area, but it was just an empty area. I programmed a plant, but that was all there was. Pushing up from the desk, I shifted over towards the corner and shifted the plant away. It was a normal corner. There was nothing on the floor or the walls. I trailed my fingers along the wallpaper where the sides met and sighed. 
I'm not sure what I was expecting to find. Some secret door? Perhaps the answer to life's mysteries? Smiling at my own stupidity, I shook my head a moment and went to step away. Until I looked up. Until I looked at the ceiling for just a moment and saw something that completely froze me in my steps. There was a symbol, drawn in perhaps a sharpie? It was a small circle with a line going through it. Normally such a symbol wouldn't have bothered me. I would have merely brushed off that fact as something the designers built and forgot to remove. It wasn't uncommon. Tate had shown me plenty of buildings where designers left their unnoticed marks. The reason that this particular one caused such a chill was due to how often I had seen it. The first time I noticed this symbol was in the bathroom. Someone had etched it inside the wooden cabinet. I thought this was strange, but brushed it off. I found that symbol again etched on the wall behind my bed. I didn't completely understand what it had meant, but I started to learn that the symbol was important. Then this thought was validated when I saw the same symbol resting on the corner of a page that was being shared among those that were assisting with the project. During one particularly boring afternoon, I started to search through the group notes for said symbol. I found it listed throughout several other notes. However, when I searched it, I found nothing. Disappointing, but I simply returned to my work. Now, as I stared up at the ceiling with that symbol glaring back, my stomach twisted. The fact that the symbol was brought up was terrifying enough, but there was a fact more terrifying. Those symbols appeared on every pile of notes about the projects that took place before me for several years that however vanished only a few weeks before I was hired. This symbol was clearly attached to a singular person and his ability to express himself, a person who completely vanished. All the names attached to the notes were still present, so either this shadow suddenly decided to stop drawing a symbol that was covering their notes and at this office, or something happened and they were removed from the notes, possibly having occupied this location prior to my employment. Moving back to my computer, I read over the message slowly before a second message pinged, appearing on the screen with an even more to the point message. They're coming. Yep, that did it. Quickly logging out of my computer system, I darted into my room and started to search through my drawers before hesitating and frowning for the moment. What in the world was I doing? I didn't need to grab anything. In fact, it would look better if I was still here. Stepping over towards my bed, I glanced at the curled up ball on the bed and frowned. My way out. Hey, Bella. Reaching over, I pet her behind the ears and offered a weak smile. Such a wonderful cat. However, she was just an automated program I created. I could turn her into a mouse or a dog if I so wished. Or a person. I had never done so because there is only one person I would have bothered to create, but no system could mirror him. Not even a chance. Picking up the cat, I placed her on the ground before using my UI to edit her settings. Taking a few moments toggling with the settings, I created a mirrored image of myself without much difficulty. It was strange staring at a form that was your own, being able to walk around and see angles of your own body that you never thought about. My hair looked awful from the back, and once I was out of here, I was burning that skirt. It looked unflattering, and honestly, I always hated office wear. All right, Bella, just keep on being you. Just lounge around and have fun. I smiled at her the best I could. However, she didn't speak back, simply stared before mirroring my smile, nodding. Ugh, was that my smile? No, not the time. Focus now. Moving to the other side of the office, I stared at the symbol for a moment more, then pulled the chair over. Standing atop, I pressed my hands against the tile and it gave. Inhaling sharply, I looked over at Bella, waving to get her attention. Come here. Help me up and then move the chair back. Just play solitaire or something. With a simple nod, Bella crossed the room and allowed me to step into her cupped hands. Pushing up the tile, it lifted with ease, and I shoved it away to grasp the edge of the wall. With both a push from Bella and a tug from myself, I was able to lift up from the office and into the darkness above. I never once thought about what was beyond the ceiling. It was pitch dark, but the ground was solid. Looking around, I could see seams of light from my office to the left, and to the right, darkness. It was solid here, so I scooted back. Peering into the room, I offered one last smile returning Bella's wave and watching as she returned the plant and took the chair. Grabbing the tile, I tugged it back in place and soon lost the little bit of light I had. I was in the darkness now, having no idea where the hell I was, and honestly, I was terrified. 
don't cry. Now isn't the time to cry. Standing up, I brushed off my skirt and looked around. From what I could see, the area I stood on seemed to stretch for quite a while. In every few feet, there were thin lines that glowed, lights peering out from the ceiling tiles. The shapes were all perfect squares, and I started to connect the dots. All the offices were connected to a grid, and somehow I was standing on top of the entire grid system. Tilting my head back, there was the solid darkness that I assumed was the floor of another floor. I was between the levels of gate, in between the coating. My chest was tight, and I gripped my shirt, whimpering slightly as I felt a few tears drip down my cheeks. I just wanted to get a decent job to help provide a better life for Tate and I. I just wanted to make him happy, to give him a stable income so he could design all the things he would tell me about over dinner. I never wanted this, sneaking out of my stupid office and caught in some in-between. I didn't know what to do. Tate would. He could handle this with ease. Tate would move. He would explore and keep alert. Nothing kept him down for long. I had always admired that about him. Slowly breathing out, I flexed my hands for the moment and began to move, carefully walking along the darkest parts and avoiding the ones with glowing lines that were, most likely, weak ceilings. As I walked, a final message popped up on my UI. Go offline. I obeyed, without question. Chapter 13. Emmett. We have to be careful going inside here. We utterly have no idea what could be ahead. There could be traps or guards, maybe a boss fight. Em, we should get the damn door open first. I laughed in response to his statement, nodding. Stepping towards the door, I looked over the exterior for a moment. There was no handle, but that was completely fine. I knew these doors well. They were the kinds that you opened with a code rather than a handle. Touching the door gently, a pad appeared and I tilted my head for only a moment. Can you open that? Tate spoke up behind me, and I nodded gently, tracing my fingers along the pad before tapping my inventory and then the pad. A moment passed, and the door clicked open. Still works. How the hell did you do that? Opening the door widely, I placed a finger to my lips and stepped inside. Looking around, I motioned Tate to follow and close the door behind him, speaking softly. It's a key, so to speak. My sister had this awesome key she won from beating one of the first bosses ever created in Den. She was the first to beat it, so they gave her this amazing key. It was meant to open any dungeon and chest. However, the coating was messed up, and so it can actually open any door. At least that's what she told me. In truth, I think she made it herself. See, she used to work here when she was younger, and was quite the hacker. A bit of a cheater, too. I laughed a bit, and Tate smiled, squeezing my arm. Where is your sister now if she doesn't work here? Not sure, if I'm being honest. I think she ran away, honestly. She was never a fan of this town. In fact, she hated it. So if she left, I wouldn't be shocked. We were really close when I was young, but over the last few years we started to grow apart. I guess she was just really caught up with Gade and stopped having time. I found myself frowning now, comforted by Tate's lingering hand, but looking towards him when he stepped in front of me and took the lead, taking me down the hallway and not entering the first door, but the second. Tate? Just trust me. Follow my lead. I did. However, I said his name more gently now, eyes narrowed. Where are you going? I kept my voice low, still looking around as we wandered. Well, wandering for me, but apparently leading for Tate. It was annoying, not knowing what was going on in someone else's head. Don't leave me out of the loop, man. Just breathe. He laughed gently, stopping as we walked into a room. I nearly crashed into his back, gripping his shirt to steady myself. I was rather jealous of his avatar, far larger than my own. Warning! Jeez, it hurts to walk against a solid wall. Sorry, didn't realize you were so close. Anyhow, I know this room. In fact, I know this entire building. I knew the building from before, too. I designed them. I watched now, eyes wide and terribly confused. Bullshit! I don't remember these blueprints coming across our tables. Besides, Gate had been around for quite a time. How in the world was he able to design this? Tate glanced towards me, and I didn't bother to hide the shock and disbelief on my face. You can pick up your jaw now. It was before you joined the company. Don't forget, kid, I'm older than you. I've been with the company for quite a while. I helped with tons of projects even when I was an apprentice. I worked in the main building, and when I started working full-time, I helped to design this Elysium world. I had no idea this was for Gate, but at least it means I know where everything is. 
From here, I can find my way to the office rooms. She's probably lingering there. Though I was listening to Tate speak, my attention stayed focused on the room and where we were walking. The entire room was a bloody mess, a large concrete square with scattered machinery everywhere. Thick pipes and wires reached the floor like massive vines, even hanging from the ceiling. The entire room felt cold, but more than that, dark. It would be easy to trip and break something in this place. While the room was important, there was something else just as important. A shadow across the room. Tensing, I grabbed Tate's arm tightly and tugged him to the side. Without speaking, I pointed towards the shadow, and he followed without a sound. Ducking behind a large cart covered with equipment, I rested on one knee, my hand coming to cup Tate's and cover my own. I shrugged as he stared at me, both completely confused and slightly creeped out by the fact that I was gripping his face a bit tightly. Slapping my hand away, he shifted around the cart, and I followed him from the other side. The shadow grew in size as whoever approached came closer. I frowned and gripped the cart tightly, bracing myself. Whoever it was, we could totally take them. It wouldn't be too hard, right? Even if they were a tall guy, Tate could fight them. If they were smaller, I could easily take them. Both our levels were quite high, and it wouldn't be much of an issue. At least I thought so. Then I saw the source of the shadow. That wasn't a small, nor a tall guy. It wasn't a guy at all. It was a monster. What came around the corner was something beyond my wildest imagination. Large and hulking, I wasn't sure what to make of the beast. This mechanical beast. It was large and humanoid, walking on two legs and swinging arms. The mentioned limbs were composed of thick metal that almost looked like a skeleton. Its body was hunched forward. Its hulking chest and shoulders was covered in a thick layer of what I could only assume was skin, pulled taut across its heaving shoulders. With each step, its metal lower jaw bobbed, hanging rather loosely from its bald and fleshy head. As the creature came closer towards us, I was able to make out even more details. It had three eyes, two small ones on the left pressed together and a bulbous one on the right. Both were large metal circles emitting a deep red light. The red beam cast it over the floor and walls as its head swung precariously while it walked, gaze swaying but not truly focusing on anything. Thick cables and wires extruded from the creature's thick back and misshapen head, looking reminiscent of a science fair gone completely wrong. It's awful. Tate spoke under his breath, and I nodded a moment, but my attention was focused on something else. I was focused on what the creature was dragging. A body. A woman's body. My eyes grew wide and I whipped around, grasping Tate with both my hands and yanking him down roughly. I only saw for a moment, but I knew who that was. Pam. Tate was already standing when I grabbed him, shaking my head. He glared at me, but I still shook my head. Jumping out wasn't the best idea. A large ding echoed through the room. Wait, just wait. Running in headfirst is an awful idea. Tate glared at me, but he didn't speak again. Instead, he peered out and watched the creature. It was fascinated with something on the opposing wall, giving us time to get a better look over Pam. Its metallic fingers released the body, letting it fall to the ground with the slightest sound. She looked a mess, her hair spilling across the floor and across her face. Her shirt was ripped, showing her stomach, and even from here I could tell her stomach was slashed, just like her legs that were twisted in an unnatural way. It was gut-wrenching, but I did my best not to focus on this. I instead focused on the large wound on her arm. It appeared that a large bite had been taken from her body and left a sizable hole. However, there was no blood. Instead, the spot was terribly dark, pixels flickering faintly. That wasn't Pam. Smiling and letting out a sound of relief, I tugged Tate towards me, whispering in his ear. That's not Pam. Look at her arm. See that glitch? If it was Pam, she would be bleeding. They said real-world limitations apply here, so that must be an NPC. What? I sighed, rolling my eyes now, only because I knew this was a hard thing to explain in a few words, so I did the best I could. Computer person? That doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that that isn't Pam. She must have set up a diversion. She's creative like that. I glanced and Tate was smiling, though it was tense. His eyes were wet, slowly blinking. Even if it was a false body, seeing her body was no doubt rather scarring. It was even unsettling to me. I wasn't even in love with Pam. I simply thought she was a sweet girl, at least from the pictures and stories I heard from Tate. The creature began to move, its gears whirring and jaw moving up and down rapidly, and the gear connecting the jaw started to spin wildly. It seemed interested in something, but it took me a moment before I noticed a man standing at the other end of the room, 
blocking the door the monster was lumbering towards. Its red, beaming gaze coated the man with its red hue, a tight smile in response. I see you found a meal. His voice was soft, empty. He approached slowly, staring at her body before tilting his head, staring at her arm. Apparently he noticed the same as me, and a soft ah was heard. Miss Bella, I see. His gaze met the monster's, and his smile faded just slightly. It would seem we have a mouse on the loose. Do be a good boy and get rid of this infestation. Tate shifted, but I tugged him down again, gripping him tightly while I continued to watch. The man stepped towards the false Pam, nudging her head with his foot, a soft shame heard before striding past her and across the room. Before he made it to the other side, he vanished, and I felt my chest growing tight. I knew that man. I knew that face. That's Rivera. He's going after Pam. She got out. I'm not going to sit here. Tate! There was no point in arguing with him. Tate was able to stand with ease, my fingers sliding away as I whined in protest, glaring at the man as he quickly accessed his inventory, summoning his large double-sided axe. Admittedly, it was pretty awesome, but I was still freaking out. Jumping from my spot, I summoned my own armor, a similar steel and two daggers appearing in my hands. I'm killing you later, Tate. I didn't want to fight. As he leaped forward, Tate used his momentum to swing in a full arch, the blade of his axe connecting with the monster's shoulder. As it let out a curdling scream, a loud ding echoed through the room. Above Tate, a large font appeared in the air, full letters stating, Enter Battle. Below were smaller letters, going into further detail. Mission, survive. Tate glanced up for a moment before yanking his axe free. As he pulled the blade free, wires spouted free from the wound. What the hell is that, Emmett? You started a PvP match. If you start a PvP, you can't leave till your opponent is dead or recedes. You're going to have to defeat him, idiot. I snapped at him loudly, yet even as I said this, I bore my daggers against the monster's metal arms. The ragged edges caved against its hard skeleton, and sparks flew before my face. A similar message appeared over my head. I paid it little mind, though, as I stepped back in time to notice that our friend's crying was louder than I noticed. A twin appeared from around the corner. I hate you, Tate! Yanking away from the original monster, I provided my full attention towards the second monster. This was awful. I hated fighting, if I was being honest. I usually sniped NPCs and gained my levels through that. I avoided PvP the best I could. But what the hell was this? NPCs? Monsters? Actual players? The creature before me cried out as I popped out before it, its attention having been locked on its ally. I am now the smaller male that moved quickly due to my level boosts. I always boosted my speed due to hating traveling, but right now, it was probably going to save my life. Bearing my twin fangs deep within the creature's chest, I grinned when it cried out, thrashing wildly. Yanking my blades free, I stumbled back a few steps before whipping my head to glance at Tate. He was doing well enough. That axe suited him. And the fact that this beast held Pam, though fake, mind you, seemed to spark a rage in him. I suppose leveling up his strength helped as well. As he yanked his axe free from the monster's fleshy shoulders, the weight caused the axe to swing back quite a bit, however. Tate seemed unfazed. Keeping his strong grip, he allowed the top-heavy weapon to dip down, scraping the sharp metal against the ground before swinging straight up. His grip twisted a bit due to the awkward position. However, the force caused a decent amount of damage, the axe bearing against the metal leg. The sudden crashing hit caused its knee to buckle, and the beast cried out, stumbling a moment. Letting out a large roar, it swung its large body towards Tate, jaw swaying as it screamed in his face, claws digging into Tate's side. Gritting his teeth, Tate hissed in pain, stumbling back, and his body nearly hitting against my own. Distracted by Tate, worried about his well-being, I cried out in pain as claws bore down against my shoulder, yanking me towards the beast. Its claws were sharp nails, easily cutting against my skin, and blood spread out against my clothing beneath the armor. Letting out a loud curse, I nearly fell against the ground as the beast ripped its claws from my body. The only reason I didn't collapse was due to the large cart I fell against, trying to grasp it for leverage. Taking a sharp breath from the pain, I forced myself up and looked over to Tate, who stared back at me, panting. He had gotten hit when I wasn't looking blood dripping down his face. It had cut his head, a large gash with a steady stream that trailed down to his jaw. Switch! He shouted this loudly, and before I can reply, Tate grasped his handle tightly and swung his axe in a large arc like before, only this time the target was much more centered. 
Panting heavily, I watched in both awe and slight horror as the sharp blade came down against the deformed skull of the beast. Letting out a mangled cry, the screech of the blade against the metal filled the room, followed by a loud popping and electricity fizzling. The beast slumped forward, face first against the ground, body growing limp. It was pretty cool, I'll admit that. Pushing up on the cart, I gripped my blades tighter and stepped towards the original beast. My left arm ached with pain, blood dripping down to my hand and against the handle of my knife. Despite this, I kept a well enough grasp while jumping towards the beast, bringing both my knives down and against its eyes. Thankfully, it was distracted by the death of its comrade, and it gave me the chance I needed for my attack, to bear my knives deep within the creature's eyes and successfully blind it. From here, I yanked away and shoved both knives against either side of its thick neck. Like Tate's, my attack was greeted by the sound of gears popping and crackling electricity. Pulling my blades away, disgusting black oil spurted out from its wounds, covering my blades, hands, and shirt. With a grimace, I looked over towards Tate and provided a tired but proud smile. Well, that sucked. Tate laughed a bit behind me, patting against my good shoulder as I pulled up my inventory. From it, I withdrew two potions and offered one for Tate, then chugged my own. The taste was different than what I knew before. It was slightly sweet before, but now it was awful. The taste was bitter and thick. Knitting my brows, I swallowed down the liquid that was nearly sludge, coughing as the bottle slipped from my fingers and fell to the floor. Tate started to gag beside me, tossing the bottle to the floor as well, while rubbing the back of his hand over his mouth. That was terrible. Do you always drink those? They usually don't taste so bad. It must be because of the real-world implications. Tate snorted, turning his head away. He made a small comment of preferring straight whiskey rather than this before stepping towards the creature he killed, peering over the beast. Ugly thing, huh? I spoke up softly, eyeing the creature. What the hell are they? Figure it out later. Pam's in danger. You said that guy was Rivera. That means she's been working for this psycho? Tate was still panting, and I smiled weakly, stepping over and motioning to his UI. Here, level up. It'll make you feel stronger and rested. We're going to need it if we're going to push forward into this hellhole. Following my instructions, he tapped away at his screen before a soft ding was heard, leveling up twice. A higher level, I only gained one, but I didn't mind. Having another finished mission was a nice feeling, even if it was more a murder than anything. When you finish up missions, you can collect gold for it later. You want to? With the gold, we can get weapons. M, not right now. We need to focus. I stared at him for a moment, and he sighed loudly, letting his head fall back. Fine. Can I just clean up this blood first? At first I perked, but then my head tilted slightly. Blood? Glancing down at my own wound, the potion healed most. However, the leveling up outside of my battle cleaned me up, aside from this weird oil. That's strange. Your bloody wounds heal from potions, but blood and such should start to fade when you're done with your mission. I never got a completed mission notice. I wish he told me that before. Going to speak, my mouth opened, but words didn't come out. Instead, a loud gag was heard as my body lurched forward. Pain shot through my body like fire as nails were piercing my back. Taking a raspy breath, I tried to inhale. However, it's choked, blood spurting out from my lips. Tate stood before me, eyes wide and visibly trembling. My UI was still drawn, and I could see the misshapen shadow looming behind me as a message appeared. 0329. Panting heavily, I lifted a shaking, bloody hand and typed the numbers against my pad, smearing it with blood that coated my UI during the action. My hand slid away, smearing the blood as I looked up to Tate. Our gaze met, and I tried to force a smile, eyes fluttering. Key. I spoke the words gently before the pain increased, my body burning. Tate screamed loudly, but I started to fade just as he lifted his axe and charged. My UI flickered out just before I hit the ground with a sick thud, eyes falling shut. Chapter 14 Tate I never witnessed death before. Both my parents were still living, and even then, I doubt I would be there to see their last moments. It was utterly awful seeing the way his eyes almost seemed to blink out, watching his body slump forward, sliding off the creature's hand and falling to the floor with a thud. The sound caused my stomach to twist, and I lost myself for a moment, swallowed with rage. 
I didn't remember moving, nor raising my axe, but I did so. I ran forward, letting out a cry of frustration as I buried my axe deep within its skull. Beneath the force of the blade, I felt the metal crack and wire sprouted out from the thick crack that was growing across the top of its head. As the creature crumpled, my fingers slipped away from the hilt of the sword, yanking my body away. I tried to blink away the moisture that was swelling within my eyes, but my chest felt tight and I wanted to scream again. This couldn't be happening. I couldn't do this alone. Dropping to my knees, I stared at the bleeding form of Emmett, of my friend, and whimpered. While I didn't often find myself emotional, there were times when I caved in, when everything I held within bubbled up. This was one of those moments. This was one of those rare times when tears dripped down my cheeks and my hands shook with uncertainty. As I touched Emmett, a small screen appeared over his body, offering me his inventory. Taking a small breath, I collected everything. His items, his bounty, but most of all, his key. I would need that if I was going to save Pam, if I was going to make sure that Emmett's loss wasn't in vain. Pushing up, I rifled through his inventory before selecting several weapons. Along with my large war axe, I attached a crossbow to my belt and a quiver over my shoulder, filled with bolts. While I knew it would take me a time to reload, it was going to hurt like a bitch. Gearing up, tucking away the money and gathering my emotions, I pulled Emmett away from the creatures, carefully tucking his body up against the wall and ensuring his eyes were closed before heading out from the cable-covered room. The layout of this building was already mapping out in my mind, gathering up all the important details and what rooms would most likely support what kind of work. I knew for a fact that the cubicle-like offices were towards the back. However, if Pam set up a decoy, then she must have escaped. It was unnerving, but I didn't stop for a moment. Making my way through the building, I tore through everything that crossed my path, which was quite a lot. Apparently, the screeches from my first match carried on, and, well, they were understandably pissed. It was difficult not having Emmett at my side. I didn't have someone to tell me what the hell I was doing— but as I made my way, I started to feel things out. When I killed a creature, I earned experience and awards. Emmett had explained this part to me, that I had to watch my health and keep myself focused. Every hit would draw down my health, and if I blacked out, well, that wouldn't end well, because there wasn't any way to log out without the safe town. If we were to die here, it would have real-world implications. Emmett was proof alone. These bastards removed the emergency exit. I realized that the moment we left safe town. Emmett was terribly nervous about this fact, but we pushed forward. I couldn't get him out of my thoughts, and I couldn't get the image of Pan's copy laying on the floor, broken and alone. I never saw death before, and now I have seen the bodies of two people that meant the most to me. How strange, how dear I realized Emmett was to me, only after losing him. They always said you never knew what you had till it was gone. I suppose the same could be said with Pam. As I tore my way through the halls, I ripped through three more of these awful monsters. Thankfully, they were smaller than the two we faced. They were more flesh-covered than the original creature, although they looked nothing like a human. An abomination. Standing at the end of the hallway now, I took a moment to gather myself. I was rightfully exhausted, panting heavily and leaning against the axe for support. Thankfully, M had an assortment of health potions that aided in the exhaustion. Yes, the taste was awful, but the pumped feeling I was left with was exhilarating. A burst of energy surged through my body with each awful gulp, causing a tingle to rush through me down to the very tips of my fingers. This felt like a drug, but I didn't want to make that comparison right now. I needed to stay focused on my goal. It would be easier if my UI wasn't constantly squeaking at me. Since I stepped inside this hallway, my small screen had been beeping at me loudly, and I was growing quite irritated. Now having a chance to relax, I started to go through the screen and its settings, trying to make sense of all the small printed information without the help of my all-knowing friend. Pam would laugh to see how frustrated I was with a simple screen, how irritated I was becoming at a small noise. She always said these features would annoy me when I was in the game. She always knew those little things about me. Fingering through the settings, it took me far too long to figure out the source of the awful sound, which apparently seemed to be my awards. After leveling up so many times, I had quite the amount saved up, which only triggered after having entered an actual fight. I assumed it was because I finished my first mission that unlocked the awards for me, but I had no one to ask. Standing in this hallway, in this silence, 
a loneliness started to settle in. Had Pam been dealing with this dreadful sense of abandonment since joining this horrific project? Sighing, I finally stepped away from the wall and continued my way through the maze work of the building that was Gate. When I had first designed this layout, I thought it was built in an awful way. Everything was like a grid system. However, that was what the client wanted. Now, walking among my design, I started to realize that it was more like a prison cell than a bundle of cubicles. It was a prison of my own design, and that the woman I loved was trapped within. It was an awful feeling, this realization and guilt. Despite how awful the situation was, I had to admit, leaving a trail of bodies was rather thrilling. It was a morbid thrill, to say the least. However, I couldn't deny how excited I felt seeing my meter of XP increasing and watching their health deplete with each slice. The lower my own points became, the more frantic and violent I became. It was apparently a bonus from the avatar model I was using, which wasn't as large as the one I had originally picked, though this one was far faster on its feet. I didn't think that this would matter much to me, but being able to sprint and bear my axe against the beast was exhilarating. Perhaps I was getting far too engaged into this situation. Stepping through the doorframe into a large room, I scanned the area, eyeing the several doorways. This area was a hub, so to speak, connecting many different sections all into one large square. The cubicles were off towards the left, and towards the right was maintenance. Straight ahead, on the other hand, was meeting rooms and larger offices. No doubt this was used by the project leaders. The point was, if anyone was still here, anyone that could talk to me, they were probably here. Checking my points and status, I felt decent enough. The thrill from the potion had worn off, but my own adrenaline from the situation was coursing through my veins. I had nearly stepped through the threshold when I felt a slight pain when an apparent rock bounced off my armor. Startled, I gripped my weapon tight and turned around to see where the hell it came from. As I turned, a loud, look out, echoed as my eyes settled on a notably smaller monster lumbering towards me. Gripping my axe tightly, I entered combat with my side swing against the creature's neck, causing it to screech and slam against the ground. I didn't hesitate, not for a moment. Slamming my steel boot against its head, its red and mechanical eyes glared at me as I brought my axe down once more against the already cut neck. With my hard swing, my axe tore through the metal with some resistance before a tremor traveled up the axe and through my arms as the blade met the ground. Shoulders heaving, I allowed my fingers to slip away from the hilt of the axe, which was embedded deep enough against the creature's skin that the weapon stood on its own. The monster's head was nearly detached from its body at this point, mechanical eyes black and empty. Rubbing my hands against the fabric of my pants that wasn't coated with armor, I finally caught my breath and had time to look around for the source of the voice. It wasn't hard to find. Slowly standing from behind a large cluster of broken machinery was a pair that looked worse for wear. Their clothes were torn, blood caked against their limbs and faces. Approaching slowly, the man winced away. However, the woman stood her ground, glaring at me through her mess of hair, some damp from the blood. Reaching out, I offered her a potion and a soft smile. Here, I think you need this. I offered a second to the man, which was taken after a few moments of hesitation. Both drank eagerly, and I had a chance to look back towards the body that was holding up my weapon. How long have you been hiding here? I stopped counting. Her voice was soft, shaking vividly like her hands. I couldn't imagine having been trapped within this building for days at a time. I've only been trapped within for a few hours, and I already felt the wear at not only my body, but my mind as well. Nodding to her statement, I motioned them to step out from their hiding spot, and I kept my weak smile. You're a mess, but I hope those potions helped. Why didn't you run out to Safetown? The woman frowned, looking towards the man she was with. He hadn't spoken much, but finally did after a moment, lighter than I expected. We couldn't open the door. It was locked. We tried every key and code we have, but nothing seemed to work. We've been tucked away inside here since, hiding from those awful things. He huffed after speaking, tucking the now empty bottle away in his bag, facing me once again. Thank you, again. My name's Carver. This is Ashley. She smiled slightly, nodding. Sorry about the rock. I didn't want to give us away, but it was sneaking up behind you. The smaller ones are troublesome. They're weaker, sure, but they're also quieter. We have to be very careful when dealing with those things. Surveying the area, I slowly nodded along with what she had to say before stepping towards my axe and tugging it free from the beast. Well, stick with me. I'm trying to find someone, but I'll bring you with me. 
I'm not leaving anyone in this hellhole. Sounds good, but we need to start moving. When one of those screams, the others come ready. We've been watching them for, well, however long we've been stuck here. Good to know. I didn't allow us to linger for long. These abominations were able to move quickly, and the last thing I wanted was us to get flanked or boxed in. Both sounded awful, but I did the best I could to keep my focus on the task at hand rather than the growing worries that were settling deep inside my head. Making our way down the hallways, we had been left alone for the most part, luckily not seeing one of those massive beasts. Despite the ease I felt at the moment, I knew for a fact luck wasn't on our side. We would face those hideous creatures at any moment, and so I spared several pieces of armor towards my company. I provided them with weapons as well, even attempting to explain how they were used, but the couple laughed me off, stating they had been long-time players in the past. They knew their weapons well. Was everyone a gamer here besides me? Why are you here anyway? I mean to purposely break into gate and not run the moment you saw those awful machines. Ashley glanced at me for a quick moment to eye my reaction, and I just chuckled, shrugging slowly. I already knew how what I was going to say would sound, but there was no other way to word it. I... There's someone I care about who's stuck inside here. I came to bring her home. Ashley laughed a bit now, grinning. On the other side of me, Carver's shoulders eased, a soft smile of his own. He seemed pleased at the sound of her laughter, a sound he hadn't heard in who knew how long. That's really sweet. Who was it? Before I could answer, a loud sound caught our attention, a scraping sound that caused us all to cringe. From the doorway in front of us, a large shadow spilled out into the hallway. Instinctively, I stepped in front of the pair with me protectively and took a fighting stance. As the shadow grew, a beast finally stepped out into the hallway, stumbled out actually. Its body fumbled past the doorway and slammed against the opposite wall. The large mass slumped, attempting to stand, yet still went down as a large mallet came down against its skull. Standing before me, panting and trembling, was a woman I hadn't seen for weeks beyond my dreams. My heart skipped a beat, and I sharply inhaled, tightly gripping the hilt of my weapon. Pam lifted her head now, eyes meeting my own and eyes widening. Her, actually. Chapter 15 Pam Yanking my hammer from the creature's head, my gaze locked with Tate's, and the hammer fell to my side. Clattering to the ground loudly, I ignored the sound as I closed the space between myself and the group, throwing my arms around Tate's neck. I didn't mind that there was a company, nor that Tate hated public affection. I assumed that this was an exception. Burying my face against his neck, I grinned, ignoring the tears streaking down my face. Pulling back, Tate smiled at me for a moment, kissing me gently and cupped my face gently. Hey. I laughed at his lackluster greeting, tucking my face against his chest once more. Hey. Tate kept his arms wrapped around my body, hand slowly rubbing against my back before slowly pulling away, squeezing my shoulder and lightly kissing my forehead. I didn't even know what to say. I stammered for a moment but finally spoke bluntly. You swore you wouldn't step foot in this awful place if it was the end of the world. It almost was. There was an explosion. I thought something happened. The statement was surprising, causing my face to burn and I giggled weakly, biting my lip. Oh, how I missed Tate. This is all well and good. Really cute guys, but we're still in a maze of death. Yanking away from Tate, I faced a very unimpressed Carver and Ashley, a pair I had met several times before. His arms were crossed, brow raised while he watched this little scene unfolding. Right, well, now that we're all snogged and chummy, shall we be on our way? I snorted a bit, nodding and reluctantly pulling away from Tate to grab my large mallet. Carver is right, we have to move quickly. Come on, follow me. Turning back inside the office, the trio followed me inside, passing another creature's limp body sprawled out on the floor. A large office spread out, but their attention wasn't focused on the office, but instead the gaping dark hole in the ceiling. Tate, Carver... Help me move this desk. With their aid, we grabbed the large piece of furniture and shoved it flush against the wall. Placing my mallet back inside my inventory, I jumped up on the desk and hoisted myself up and into the ceiling. The party followed suit, with Carver going last and helping me push the tile back in place. Where the heck are we? Ashley was notably tense, fumbling in the dark until she found Carver's hand, 
gripping it tightly and groping around till she found my arm, which she gripped just as tightly. Sorry, Pam. Yeah, don't worry about it. It will take a while before your eyes adjust to the lighting. Just stay close or hold on to me. We'll make it through this. I spoke gently, taking Ashley's hand into my own and leading the group through the darkness I had grown to know quite well over the last few hours. True to my nature, I adapted quite well to the new situation, doing my best to ignore my own inner anxieties about the current events. From the back of the group, Tate spoke up, asking just what the hell I was doing inside that office. Research. I smiled, able to feel him glaring at me through the darkness. I knew that something was going on, so I escaped from my office. I received this weird message that saved my life. They helped me escape and told me about this in-between space. I have no idea who they are, but they've done so much for me. If it wasn't for them, I don't think... I don't think I would have ever gotten to see you again. I didn't feel I had to clarify who my words were meant for. This office belonged to Mr. Rivera. I knew that if something was going on and he was involved, the information would have to be in here. I was able to break in and read through his files. That's why I didn't have time to run before they came. You seem to handle yourself just fine. I laughed slightly, nodding in the darkness, my eyes adjusting back, and no doubt the others were having an easier time seeing as well. I always have, you know that. Reaching another area where light seeped in from below, I finally stopped moving and allowed the pair to gather themselves. What did you learn? Too much. I almost regret learning any of this in the first place, but I know the truth now. Mr. Rivera, he was involved in all of this. These monsters, the disappearances, even all the glitches, everything was him. They always said that they were researching medicine, yet it was all a lie. They weren't interested in learning about things that could save humanity. They wanted to change them. They were doing human experiments. No. Ashley spoke up loudly, not to argue but more due to disbelief. She had worked with Gate far longer than I had, for years. She had a deep-seated confidence with Rivera, never once challenging him, even when I started to. I... that doesn't make sense. Yes, it does, Ashley. Don't play dumb. You know for a fact that things have been strange lately. We're being locked out of programs we should always have access to. We're being pushed out, and we know for a fact several people are missing. They refuse to tell me anything about Jordan. His shout was a bit startling. However, Ashley reached out in the darkness before hugging him silently, rubbing the man's back. He calmed after a few moments, sighing. I'm sorry, I just... Jordan meant so much to me, and they refused to tell me anything. I understand. I would have reacted the same way if it was regarding Tate. As a matter of fact, I'm more than sure it's due to being unable to find information on my well-being that drove Tate to dive headfirst into this artificial world that he hated more than anything. Smiling to myself, I looked towards where Tate was lingering, then back towards the line streams of light we stood near. We need to get out of here. It's not safe. Those creatures, they... My words trailed off, frowning. I wasn't quite sure how to explain what I learned, but Carver spoke up. They eat their victims. We saw them do so to a few of the workers they captured. It was awful. He shuddered at the memory, and I saw, as best I could in the dim light, as Tate stepped over and firmly patted against the man's shoulder. It was a rather kind interaction, causing me to smile slightly before eyeing the tiles before us. We need to escape while we can. The problem, though, this safe spot we have doesn't stretch to the door out. I tried, but I can't get through that ceiling. We'll need to drop into a room beside the entrance and book it. We can do that. Tate spoke softly, smiling, but I shook my head. The door you came in is the only way out, and they know we're in here now. No way they're going to let us leave. They'll be waiting for us. We'll have to fight our way out of this shit or else we can't leave. I can fight. Carver, too. We've played plenty of den during our days, and we've gained enough levels to handle ourselves. Good. Very good. While I was at a very decent level, I was worried about having to watch two people while keeping my eye on Tate. Yes, I had gotten a glance at his level, and it was terribly high, but I still wanted to protect him. I had just gotten him back. I wasn't about to lose Tate again. Never again. Then we're going down. I have no idea what's down there, and I'm not about to be taken by surprise. Waiting as the team geared up, I moved the tile aside and peered down. At the moment, there was no one standing around. The cable-covered room was completely empty, aside from some bodies. I gasped loudly, rearing back and looking over towards Tate. 
I knew one of those bodies quite well. I had seen pictures of him from Tate before. He wasn't meeting my gaze, so I said nothing, simply dropping down from the ceiling. I landed with a heavy thud, my thick armor adding to my weight. Standing, I moved aside and waited for my group to join me on the floor. Ashley and Carver carried both a great sword and dual wielding respectfully, nodding to me, hinting that they were ready to move forward. The room was quiet, and I gripped my hammer tightly, frowning. The room was far too still compared to what I was expecting, which was a wall of beasts eager to rip us apart. I don't hear anything. Tate spoke from beside me, flexing his grip around his axe, frowning. Be careful. Despite saying this, Tate stepped out in front of me, weapon ready and heading forward. So much for being careful, hypocrite. He was always the protective and valor type, even if he didn't recognize these factors. Following his lead, we made our way through the room that smelled of oil and was riddled with cables and wires, my frown growing by the second. Our steps echoed in the large room, the only other sound being the hissing of the cables. Oil. I froze in my steps whipping around quickly now just as a large and metallic claw came swinging down towards me. Out of reflex, I held my sword up in defense, a loud ting echoing louder than our steps as I fell to one knee from the force, glaring up at the beast. This beast was much larger than any of the others I had yet to cross. It was near twice the size of the bodies on the floor, and its form was far more mangled and horrific. The thick flesh was pulled tight over the creature's head, shoulders, and down its torso, to what was perhaps its hips, the flesh was covered in numerous holes and scorch marks, frayed wires sprouting from the holes like weeds. Unlike the others, this behemoth had three mechanical circles on one side and two rather large on the other, one of them cracked and flickering its piercing red light. Its jaw hung low, bouncing slightly as it let out an awful sound that was, no doubt, a chuckle. Dried oil and blood caked the metallic jaw and claws. Pressing down on my sword, the creature leaned down and spoke. I had never heard these creatures speak, and I wished I never had. The voice was deep and robotic, with volume fluctuating as it casted the red light over my kneeling form. Very clever, your little masquerade. You had my little pets running around in quite a frenzy at the awful distaste you placed before us. I stared at him in confusion, and it laughed once more claws slowly wrapping around my sword as my eyes widened. I was still struggling to pry the blade loose while still being pinned in the position due to its pressure against my blade. Such a foolish little toy, aren't you? I will give you some praise for your little game has made me realize that I enjoy hunting. I did not know I felt enjoyment, so thank you. The words, though monotone, still managed to carry a sneering tone, making me shudder. Ash, go! I shouted loudly, glaring over my shoulder at the girl. She was frozen in place for the moment, but soon moved as Carver jumped into action, yanking her away and swiftly running away from the room. As the pair vanished around the corner, I provided my attention back to the beast that uttered a deep, painful grinding sound that was reminiscent of a growl and utterly chilling. Pam, go, I've got you. Tate... He stayed behind, and by the tone of his voice he had a plan. Nodding curtly, I mustered what was left of my strength and pressed back against that awful bloodied claw, using my blade to shove its grasping off to the side. It wasn't much. Nevertheless, it threw the beast off its stance for a moment, and I allowed my blade to slide from my fingers with the movement. Lurching forward, I tucked and allowed my body to roll forward between the hulking figure's parted mechanical legs. From there, I leapt to my feet and ran towards Tate. My feet hammered against the ground as I pushed myself forward, the beast growling loudly behind me while Tate threw some growing dark mass towards its direction. As I reached Tate, he grabbed me around the waist and tugged me towards the door, providing me only a moment to look back towards the mass. It was a creature, one from Den that had been spawned from Tate's abilities, a large and furious crustacean. It looked similar to a crab, however was far larger and vicious-looking than any I have ever seen. Its shell and claws were made of a sleek metal. The massive crab skittered forward, its metal legs tapping against the concrete floor as its claw lurched forward, attempting to clamp around the beast's limbs. Following Tate's lead, we ducked inside the thin hallway that was attached to the large room, and, more importantly, the entrance. Nearly running over Ashley and Carver, I doubled over to catch my breath, Tate's arm refusing to leave its hold until I spoke. 
We need to go now. I usually wasn't the type to yell. However, right now, it was very needed. Finally letting me go, Tate stepped towards the door and unlocked it. What had once been a firmly sealed door opened with ease, and Tate stepped back, offering a smile. Go. Speaking softly, Tate ushered the pair out the door and held it open before me as well. Smiling, I hurried to his side and provided a small peck on his cheek before ducking out of the building. Tate stepped out behind me, slamming the door shut and lingering by the door before returning to me. I eyed him a moment, brow raised. How did you open that door anyhow? From what I read, it was sealed by Mr. Rivera. What did you do? I honestly was curious about how in the world Tate managed to acquire such a powerful object after only being inside the game a short time. Emmett, apparently it was a gift that he wanted me to take. His response was very to the point, and I restrained from pushing the subject. Though I never had the opportunity to meet him, Tate always spoke of them with high regard, which was certainly something coming from Tate, a man who withdrew from others as often as he possibly could. Tate, I'm so sorry. I know he was your friend. We'll make it out of here and make this all worth it, I promise. Stepping away, I followed the path towards Safe Town with a gentle sigh. In the past, I always dreaded leaving the game and returning to reality. However, at this point, my only goal was to escape this coded prison. Ever since receiving that first message, everything I knew had completely changed. Those I trusted have turned out to be cruel, and those I didn't believe became my saving grace. Once we were free and back home, I knew that I would have to make this up to Tate, not only for not believing him, but, more importantly, for the fact he put his life in danger to come find me, even after a fight, even after the awful transgressions between us that night. It was times like these that I remembered why I had fallen in love with him in the first place. As we continued down the path, both Ashley and Carver exited through the border that separated the different zones. Tate followed close behind them with me at his heel. As I went to follow in his footsteps, I was stopped to a sudden halt. Attempting to take another step, I came to the same result. Reaching my hand toward Tate, my palm pressed against an invisible, solid force. For a moment, I stood still in confusion, before reality set in. This was a situation that I had come across before when I was younger. After a long day of dungeon crawling, I had attempted to leave Den without finishing up a prior mission. As I made an attempt to leave, I was greeted with a similar force, an invisible barrier that kept me from leaving. Much like now, my UI flashed rapidly, attempting to gain my attention. Panicking, I selected my alerts and read the words I never wanted to see again. Unfinished business. Below was smaller text indicating my mission, stating, Unfinished combat. Staring at the message in silence, my eyes slowly trailed away from the text and met with Tate's. He stood just past the border, brows knitted together as he waited for me to take my place at his side. My hands pressed against the wall once more, applying pressure as I gently whimpered, tears beginning to swell up in my eyes and drip down my face. Though I was looking away from him slightly, I could tell Tate was tensing up, and in moments his arms were around me once more, attempting to console me. He asked what was wrong, but for the moment I couldn't speak. Instead, I let out a choked sob, shaking my head and hiding against his chest. What had once become a place of enjoyment was now a nightmare. I just wanted to leave— to never look back, and yet Elysium held me tight, trapping me here. Pulling away from Tate, I took a slow and raspy breath before looking up to meet his gaze, offering a weak and shaken smile, tears still damp and dripping down my face as he cupped my cheeks. I have to go back. That monster, I entered combat. I'm so stupid. I have to go back, defeat it, or the system will never let me leave. The last words were weakly choked out, my shoulders shaking as I sobbed. I just wanted to return home. I just wanted to feel safe again. Lifting his hand, Tate wiped away my tears and smiled gently, nodding. We'll go kill it then. We're going to get out of here, Pam, I promise. No matter what it takes. I'm bringing you back with me. I won't leave you. Breathing in sharply, I slowly nodded and trusted in his words. Tate didn't speak words with empty intentions. Everything he said carried promise. Giving me a moment to gather myself, calm, dry my eyes and gear up, I allowed Tate to take the lead, reopening that damned door and stepping back into my cage. This time would be different. This time I wouldn't be foolish. I was prepared and I had Tate at my side. It was time to end this. For good. Chapter 16 Tate 
We were going to escape this hell, no matter what it took. If I had to fight some hideous creature, if I had to take down all of Gate and burn it, I was going to escape this awful place. I was going to bring Pam home, and we were going to get as far from this city as possible. Seeing her cry had torn my heart. Pam was a strong woman. She rarely cried. When she cried, my heart shattered, and I wanted to hold her, to protect her. This freak was going to die. Moving back inside the large room, the metallic crab I had left behind was sprawled out on the floor. The thin metal legs had been ripped from the main body and was thrown across the room, a massive dent that caved in the shell. The beast was in a rough state. Bits of wire and flesh scattered across the floor, along with splashes of oil. However, it was still standing, and its gaze slowly shifted towards me, towards Pam, and its head tilted to the side with a sick crack. A deep, electronic-like chortle echoed as the beast addressed us. You made it far, little pet. I shuddered as he continued to speak, glaring at the creature and stealing a glance to Pam. She was tense, breathing rather rapidly. Such curious little things, humans. You see, though you peer at me with such disgust, you are what created me. They created me in your image. My stomach twisted and I glared, slowly shaking my head. The action caused another weak laughter. I was a failed experiment, you see. They were so proud that I was created, that I existed. However, they promised to fix me, to make me more real, to make me human. I was to be like you, but better, stronger, more intelligent, and immune to your pathetic illnesses that eat away your pathetic bodies. From its words, Without being able to express itself, I could already tell it was grinning while it spoke. Disgusting. I wanted to beat the damn thing in the face, but honestly, that was the plan. Kill this creature and get as far away from Gate as possible. You're the furthest thing from human I've ever seen. Is that why you killed those people? Because you ended up some ugly electronic Rubik's Cube instead of a person? With a loud creak, its head snapped back into place as it stepped towards me that red light casting over my entire body, and I felt a slight heat from the gaze. For the moment, I was frozen to my spot. The way it spoke was horrifying. I was frightened. Its large form leered over me as it spoke again, voice much louder as it stood close. I am not a puppet, no matter what those foolish people think. I am not human. I never want to be. I am far greater than them, than you, than anyone. Yet, you are wrong. I did not kill them out of vengeance. No, I killed them out of hunger. You see, these little pets are quite satisfying. I attacked one out of rage, but the taste... It was remarkable. Eating you will be very fulfilling. I find our little game has made me quite famished. As its words trailed off, a large claw rose and swung down towards me, still frozen in place. Bracing myself, I tensed for the incoming attack and was prepared to counter. However, I didn't have the opportunity. As the beast stepped close and swung its large claws towards me, Pam stepped out from behind me and swung her mallet hard against the beast's head. A loud crack echoed through the room, and I winced from the sound, stepping back and giving her more room for her assault. I had never seen Pam fight before. She was always diplomatic and friendly. People rarely ever had an issue with her, and no one had ever raised a hand. There was no reason for her to be violent, to be defensive. For a moment, just a moment. I was frightened of her holding her own weapon. This worry passed a moment later, of course, as I remembered something important. My girlfriend was addicted to that den game, and no doubt fought larger things than this monster, though probably not as horrifying to look at and 
not with so much at risk. Taking a step back, I watched as Pam launched a full-force attack against the beast. Swinging her mallet with an expertise I never expected from my rather small girlfriend, I found myself floored. Wielding it with as much skill as a trained warrior, Pam didn't seem like she was fighting. It was more like dancing. Pivoting and using her own momentum, Pam continued to slam her mallet against the beast, aiming for its arm and jaw. With another rough swing, she ripped away its face, clattering against the ground. Taking her lead, I grabbed my axe once more and charged at the beast as well. With a hard grunt, I slammed my axe roughly against the creature's arms and grinned now, enjoying myself a bit too much, at least for that moment. The one flaw with my weapon, despite how much I enjoyed it, was that the blade tended to get stuck with as it was driven in too far. Attempting to yank the blade free, the beast wheeled around and clipped me beside the head. With a sick whack, my body fell to the side like a doll, my shoulder slamming against the ground roughly. Wincing from the pain, I glared up at the creature. However, it was too distracted with Pam to pay me any mind. She was, at that moment, a force to be reckoned with. Pushing up from the ground, I checked my points. A notable drop that caused me to frown. I needed to be more careful. My health was nearly halved, and if I didn't mind myself, I was going to be reunited with Emmett. Not my ideal ending to this situation. I wasn't the only one struggling, of course. As strong as she may be, Pam was still going up against a large beast. Distracted momentarily by peeking over to see my state, the creature took its chance. Roughly grabbing hold of her form, it lifted her with ease, despite the heavy armor, and tossed her across the room. I panicked, scrambling to my feet as she slammed against the ground. Her armor clattered as she skidded against the concrete for a moment and finally stopped. Pam was still, just long enough for me to get stuck in my breath. However, she shifted, and I eased. Now, I was pissed. Turning back towards the beast, I stepped forward, blocking its view of Pam. Furious, pumping with adrenaline and completely done with the situation, I used all my strength as I attacked the creature. My axe came down hard against its chest, tearing apart the thick flesh, grunting as oil sprayed out against my chest and face. It was disgusting, but I continued to press the blade down as best I could with my strength. This time the creature was towering over me, screaming in pain as it attempted to swipe me. Hold tight! Pam called out behind me, and I obeyed without hesitation. Holding my position, I heard Pam running up behind, and I braced myself for what was to come, though she still managed to startle me. I felt a sudden weight as Pam stepped on my back, then pushed off. Looking up, I caught sight of her attack. The mallet was gone, no doubt lost when she was thrown, and instead she had two daggers. Jumping off my back, she bore both blades deep inside the creature's eyes, clinging on tightly as it thrashed and stumbled. My mallet, to the right. Pulling away, I left Pam on her own for the moment as I received her massive weapon, having to use quite a bit of strength to even lift the damn thing. The beast continued to thrash wildly, a claw swinging down and slashing my arm. Gritting my teeth to keep from crying out, from distracting Pam, I took a sharp breath and watched as she retracted one of the blades and stabbed against the beast's temple. Screeching, it finally teetered back, slamming against the ground roughly. The moment it made contact with the ground, my eyes met Pam, and I knew what she wanted without words. Taking my stance, I used all the strength I had, despite the pain, to arch the mallet over my head and smash the large weapon against the creature's head. A sick crack was followed by a disgusting splatter of oil and wires. I held the weapon in place for a moment, staying there until a loud ding was heard. I knew that sound after fighting my way through gate. The end of a match. Panting hard. I used her mallet to keep me steady and from collapsing to the ground. I was completely exhausted, sweat dripping down my face, and Pam was in no better shape. She was far worse for wear than myself. Blood and oil stained her skin, and she laughed gently, smiling at me. Letting her knives clatter to the floor, she threw her arms around me in a tight hug, and I just laughed, embracing her. Ow, careful, babe. Pulling away, Pam stepped towards the now-corpse beast, and knelt down, going through what inventory it did have. There wasn't much from the beast itself, however the reward for bringing down such a high level was astronomical. The gold was more than I ever expected, and as Pam accepted the prize I felt a surge, quite a familiar one. I was leveling up, thankfully. It helped to make my sores and bruises feel a bit better, at least. Quite a haul. She laughed gently, nodding. 
You are not too bad at this for someone who hates fighting. I'd rather never fight again. Now come on, let's get the hell out of here. Standing up, Pam grabbed my hand and we left the hyperzone for, thankfully, the final time. As we made our way to Safe Town, I provided us both with potions while we gathered ourselves. Though we were going to be leaving for a moment, I knew for a fact that the pain we were currently feeling was going to carry on with us once we left these hubs. I still can't believe you came here for me, Tate. I... I love you. Looking up from my bottle, I stared at Pam for a few moments and smiled gently, slowly nodding. I returned her words, kissing her forehead and leading her towards the logout. I'll go first. She said this rather reluctantly, fingers slowly pulling away and looking at me one final time, sparing a gentle smile before logging out successfully this time. Giving a weak sigh, I wasted no time in stepping over and logging out myself. I forgot what it felt like, being submerged inside the system, and being removed was just as strange. Once more it was like tugging my head out from a pool of water, my senses taking a moment to return. I was panting lightly, tucked inside the hub with my headset still tightly clinging to my head. Reaching up, I slowly pulled off the gear and fumbled before I was able to open up the lid of my hub. It hissed as I pushed, stumbling out. My legs felt uneasy, almost like when first stepping onto a boat. Taking a moment to steady myself, I looked up to find Pam standing a few rows away. There was a warm smile on her face, giving me a slow wave. She was far more beautiful here than in the game. I'm not sure why, but this felt so much more real. Walking towards her, I nearly closed the space between us before a familiar... Stomach twisting, grinding, cut through the air. We froze in our steps and quickly looked in horror as the mutated, hulking creature hobbled towards us from the other side of the room. Its movements were strange, quite different from before. One of its arms hung limply at its side, half of its eyes blinking rapidly and jaw caked with blood. It fell slack as the creature screamed, charging towards Pam. The creature didn't greet us this time. Its screams seeming more electronic than before, and seeming more animalistic, wilder. Standing still, Pam panicked, her eyes going wide as she looked around for a weapon. Hide! I shouted towards her, and she dove down low, crawling beneath the elevating hub as the beast's claw came down, cracking each glass as the force made contact. Acting fast, I lunged myself towards the back wall, using my elbow to smash in the small red box and yanked free the fire axe. Crawl, Pam! I could barely see her, just a glimpse as she tugged herself out from beneath the cracked hub and beneath another. The beast screamed again, trying to claw as she crawled, despite struggling with the tight rows of machinery. Tate! Pam cried out loudly when the claw caught her sweatpants she submerged in, dragging her out and bearing its sharp nails deep inside the meat of her calf. She screamed loudly and I panicked. With a rush of adrenaline, I leaped atop a hub and ran across them before launching myself forward, slamming the axe against the creature's fleshy, burned skull. Screeching in agony, the creature whipped backward, its metallic elbow catching my side and throwing me off the hub. Hitting the ground with a rough thud, for a moment the air was knocked from my lungs. Pam cried my name again, but I couldn't see her anymore. I could only see the flickering red eyes that were boring against my own, fisted claw coming down fast towards me. Curling up instinctively, I rolled out of the way from the hit, the floor vibrating from the force of its fist. As it pulled back for another strike, a loud bang echoed through the room. A gunshot. It was a sound I never expected to hear after using such medieval items since entering Elysium. Reeling back from the pain, the creature turned its attention towards the blast, thus giving me an opening. Hey, bitch! Grabbing the fire axe, I jumped to my feet and swung hard, as hard as I possibly could. My blade met with the creature's neck and it screamed, horrifically loud, but I kept pressing. My knuckles went white, my arms tensing as I applied all the strength I had. The scraping noise was unbearable, but with enough pressure I felt the wires and cables within the creature give way. Loud popping and crackling followed my swing, the beast roaring loudly in agony, before my blade sliced through to the other side. Due to the force I was applying, I stumbled forward slightly as my blade was finally free. Its large and deformed head swayed before falling back, bouncing against a hub and out onto the floor. A moment later, its huge body slammed against the ground, nearly toppling me down with it. Pam? I called out, shoving away from the fleshy form and running out from the rows. I frantically looked around before finally spotting her, 
pulling out from beneath a hub and coming towards me. Are you okay? She gripped my arm, looking at me over a moment before around the room. Where in the world did that come from? Oh! I had been wondering the same thing. However, I had already discovered the source before she spoke. A man, slumped against the wall with a gun held out, shaking. His other arm was wrapped around his waist, shirt bloody and coughing. Emmett. I whispered his name softly before rushing to his side. As I drew close, the gun clattered to the floor and he began to slide. A small bit of blood smeared on the way down, but I caught him before hitting the ground, drawing him close. Em, what? How? I spoke too fast, my arm bracing his shoulders while my hand touched his side, damp with blood. The wound was much like the one he had inside the system. It made little sense to me, but he simply smiled, teeth red as his lips, slowly blinking. Hey! His voice was weak, head coming to rest against my shoulder as Pam knelt on his other side, thin hands cupping his pale face and brushing through his hair. I... He took a raspy breath, closing his eyes. When I was attacked, I received a message with numbers. From Chell? Pam spoke curiously and Emmett slowly nodded. Yeah. She sent me a code. An emergency logout that she had coded into the system. Pam frowned now, still brushing his hair. She gently asked who this woman was, and he sighed. Chelsea, my sister. She worked with Gate. She was the one who went missing, though I realize now she probably wasn't all too missing. So your sister is in Elysium? No, no, she's dead. Slightly. Chelsea knew something was up, and she left something behind. An adaptive AI she had been building based on her own mind. While Gate was creating these monsters, she was trying to fight them from the inside. I don't know when they killed her, but they trapped her mind within the game. Pressing his face against my neck, I sighed and hugged him closer as he shook his head. Chelsea saved my life. I was already hit, but... but I'm alive. Yeah, you are. You're gonna stay that way, got it? Slowly standing up properly, I put Emmett's arm over my shoulders and Pam took the other, helping me walk him towards the exit. Stay with me, buddy. We're gonna get you somewhere safe, and we're gonna get you looked at, okay? I glanced over at Pam, and she giggled a bit, nodding. I think it's time that I took that vacation they promised me. Somewhere real, like the Grand Canyon. As far away from technology as possible. I snorted slightly, shaking my head. Really? I was just starting to get the hang of it. You're lucky I can't hit you right now, Tate. Please don't drop me. Epilogue So, I've been thinking about that den game. Maybe I should give it a try, after Emmett gets out of the hospital. Think I should let him teach me? Never mention that game again. She hissed, and I laughed loudly, kissing Pam's cheek and tugging down her sun hat just a bit, my arm tightly around her waist. Standing out on our deck, I stared out at the view and sighed. So, ready to get back to packing? Smiling, she nodded, and we stepped back into the living room that was filled with boxes. Moving with such haste wasn't normally my taste, but we didn't have much time to stand around. Everything regarding Gate was covered up by the next morning. Though we reported the incident to the hospital, according to the police, there were no monsters. No blood on the wall, the fire axe was still behind thick glass, and not a single hub was damaged. Everything from our story had been completely cleaned, as if nothing had transpired. The only evidence of the truth was Emmett's injuries and our own memories. We were moving out of this town before Gate came for us, for escaping. Emmett was submitted to the hospital under a false name, and we were packing up his apartment as well. We were now all on the run. After all, we knew what happened to loose ends. Experts are now saying that Gate is attempting to bridge both worlds, both Elysium and our own reality. Their goal in doing so is to bring virtual world objects and capabilities across from real-world implications. Gate, with its lawyers and Mr. Rivera himself, have stated that these accusations are false. Such a bridge is highly unlikely, and while they wish it was possible due to the advancements it could provide for us with medication and such, these claims are just claims. There is no evidence to support these wild reports. Despite the explosion that had occurred only a few months ago, Gate has completely fixed their building and is having all wiring and plumbing reworked to be even safer for their employees. 
A beautiful service was held for the two workers that were lost, and work has returned to normal, continuing to be the gate we all know and love. Authorities are still pursuing investigations against Gate due to statements from witnesses of the previous claims. However, no evidence has been produced and they have been unable to shut down the global superpower. Mr. Rivera, CEO of Gate, has promised that Gate will continue their expansion as promised. He has stated that there are much more things to come in the future and that they are very proud to continue improving the human race. Back to you, Veronica. This has been Hyperconnection, a dangerous game to play. Written by Luis Robles. Narrated by Kevin Giese. Copyright 2016 by Luis Robles. Production copyright 2018 by Luis Robles.